have have come to a a stop now, so I think we'll get going with the meeting. Could I just ask for anyone who is not a board member, turn their camera off, please. So we just have board members and people speaking for papers, have the, the cameras on, please. And just to know the meeting is being recorded as well. Thank you, there's a few changes now, so wait a second, thank you. OK, we will start then. Uh, item number one, apologies. Alison, could you share any apologies with us, please? Uh, oh, the, oh. Take that, fine, Leslie. Right, thank you. Uh, Sorry, uh, Leslie. Apologies from Stephen Lindsay and Hussein Patwa as board members, and we've got a number of apologies from others, attendees, Simon Boker Ingram, Kate Danskin, Geraldine Fraser and Tom Power. Thank you very much, Leslie. There's there's someone with the camera on who says guest unverified. Uh, uh, could that person please turn the camera off if they're not a board member? Thank you. Well, hopefully something will happen along those lines. Can we turn now to item two on the agenda, which is declarations of interest, please? Are there any declarations of interest? Now, I myself would like to make a transparency statement, please, um, in relation, first of all, to the Grampian Joint Health Protection Plan paper, and secondly, in relation to the Area Clinical Forum report, which is item 11.1 .1 on the paper. Um, that one makes reference to the Aberdeenshire decision around speech and language therapists, and as a transparency statement for both those items, I'm also a Aberdeenshire councillor. So I just wanted to make that statement at the beginning. Thank you. OK, uh, no other declarations of interest. We'll move on to item four, the minutes of the meeting of the 14th of March 24. Can we approve those minutes, please? Thank you. Any matters arising from those minutes? Uh, Derek, please. Just a couple of uh, housekeeping issues, really. Um, in the minute on page four, paragraph three, uh, it notes the position for the current financial year and medium term financial plan for the board at the April meeting, but it's not on the agenda. Um, Adam, do you want to comment briefly on that? Uh, yeah, thanks uh, very much, Alison. Good, good morning, everyone. Uh, Derek, I, I'll perhaps pick that up in my um, chief executive report. So I've got something in there about it uh, on the basis of um, the, the state of the approval of the of the uh, financial bit in terms of our work with government. So I'll expand on it in a minute, if that's OK. That, that's grand, Adam. And I've got another one, uh, Alison. <clears throat> in uh, page five, eight and five, the chief executive report, it talks about working on a prevention agenda to change the profile of the future need to treat disease. And I just wanted to clarify and ensure that NHS Grampian is fully part of the GP visioning exercise currently underway. Yes, I think I'll turn to June's nodding on that one. I'll turn to June just to confirm that. Yes, we are. We've we're, um, been contributing to the, the workshops, etc. Derek, and fully engaged in it. Thank you. OK, thank you very much for referencing those two points, Derek. Thank you very much. We'll move on then to, um, uh, well, my welcome, which I should have done earlier, but I'll do my welcome now. Um, thank you. And we obviously, the April meeting of the NHS Grampian board meeting, which is our second board meeting of 2024. We have a very busy agenda this morning. And to begin with, I'd like to acknowledge all the guest speakers. We have presenting papers today, as well as those members of the public and media who are joining us. You are all very welcome. Turning our attention to the agenda itself, one of the papers we have in front of us is the NHS Grampian infrastructure investment plan. Given that our capital funding position will be severely constrained for a number of years, our scrutiny of the plan, its proposed areas of focus and approach to prioritisation is absolutely vital. The plan will both shape and support how and where we provide our health and social care services over the next five years and beyond. Whilst the infrastructure investment plan is primarily concerned with larger scale industrial 
capital projects. I would like to acknowledge that not all projects are made significant by size alone, and it is my firm hope that within the funding we have available or are able to access, and through close collaboration with partners, there will be opportunities to support smaller, meaningful projects. The new clinical skills centre that I was recently asked to open at Dr Gray's hospital is a good example of this. A former ward was inexpensively repurposed and equipment purchased using ACT, which is additional costs of teaching funding provided by NHS Education for Scotland, to create a dedicated learning and development area for both students and members of staff which is a strong statement of NHS's Grampians commitment to health care education. And I would also like to again extend my thanks to the committed local teams who made this happen. At our previous board meeting, I reflected that board members would continue to ensure financial governance is balanced with good clinical governance and appropriate staff governance, as well as a continuing commitment to the prevention agenda. So, on the theme of prevention, which is enabling wellness as well as treating illness, I am pleased that the Joint Health Protection Plan for 24-26 is among the papers before us today. It provides a strategic assessment of health protection hazards posed to the Grampian population, alongside the operational arrangements intended to prevent, control and respond to them. And finally, I'm very pleased that the board is receiving a paper on the Corporate Parenting Action Plan today. Whilst our corporate parenting role is a legal responsibility, I feel very strongly that giving care experienced children, young people, adults and their families a voice is our collective responsibility. To deliver on Scotland's promise, every child should grow up loved, safe and respected to realise their full potential, and it is incumbent on us as a board to be effective corporate parents. Only by paying particular attention to children, young people and families can we enable healthier and happier future generations. So as we consider that particular agenda item today, I would ask my fellow board members to consider what more we, as individual NHS Grampian and as non-executive board members, could be doing to help drive change in this regard. Thank you. I look forward to the discussion of that and, and all the other papers as well. Moving on, uh, sorry, Ian. Apologies, Alison, it's a slightly um, delayed transparency statement. Uh, given the, the references to Aberdeen City Council in uh, the item number six, the infrastructure investment plan in relation to the mortuary, to be on the, the safe side, I will make a transparency statement that I am a member of Aberdeen City Council. However, I don't believe it's, it's uh, necessary to withdraw. Thank you very much, Ian. Welcome that. Thank you very much. OK, then moving on to item five, which is the chief executive's report. A turn to Adam, please. Thanks very much. Um, so th three things just to pick up here that aren't in uh, other papers, but really important that we uh, mention here uh, and, and in public. So the first one's about our finance uh, and setting the budget for the 24-25 financial year. Um, we, we've submitted our plan to the government and um, uh, in doing that plan exactly as Alison said we're absolutely trying to get this really key balance between money clinical uh, governance staff governance and ensuring we continue to look forward uh, to our vision uh, set out in plan for the future really thinking about that prevention and how we change the profile of disease in our population so really trying to balance those four things uh, when I wrote this report we hadn't heard back from government uh, since writing it just uh, in the last couple of days um, i've had a letter back from government and that's seeking continuing and ongoing work with us uh, around some aspects um, of the uh, budget that with the draft budget that we've set out so um obviously i will bring something back to the board formally as soon as i can and i will continue to keep the board updated on our progress uh, informally so that uh, board members are aware of of that iterative process that i'm sure we'll go through uh, working with government and particularly with policy teams and what we're trying to what we're trying to do in balancing clinical staff and financial governance so uh, that's probably all I'll say. Very happy to, to take any questions on that, obviously, uh, at the bit. Um, now, the annual delivery plan 
really sits in exactly the same camp as the uh, financial plan and certainly in informal briefings to, to board members, uh, everyone will be very aware that the delivery plan reflects that balance of what we're trying to do and the, and the financial resource we've got available. So that's sitting uh, again with uh, colleagues at government and will be part of our ongoing discussion around uh, finding uh, the right way to uh, create the budget for the forthcoming year. Uh, and the final bit that I wanted to just update people on was relating to the Baird Family Hospital and the Anchor uh, building. Um, so the, the, you'll remember at the last meeting uh, we, we gave a, a, a really clear and detailed update on what we were just working away at. The feasibility from study for Matt is, is pretty much there. Uh, and the project team and the contractors, NHS Scotland, Shaw and Government are all continuing to work really productively together. So the, the, the really good news is we're, we're getting very close to a, a, a detailed timeline, but today I'm absolutely able to say that um, we're going to be commissioning the anchor centre from the winter in 24, so a bit of a window, and that will become much more detailed, as I say, over the coming period of time. And the same commissioning process uh, from the summer of 2025. So really getting those nailed down now um, through that process that uh, we're, we're working through uh, as all the agencies that need to be involved in that. Uh, thanks very much, Alison. That was all for me. Thank you very much, Adam. Um, for that welcome update. Can I have any questions or comments about what Adam's just said, please? Sandy and then Ian. Thank you. Um, that was really helpful, Adam. I'm delighted that we've had the letter. I, I think since um, this is the first meeting for a while that we've been meeting in public, it's it's important just to acknowledge um, there's, you know, the board and, and, and the team are having lots of discussions with regard to the financial situation. And um, we had a PAFIC uh, committee meeting in February, which um, was, which was open to all board members to come along, um, where we had a lot of really helpful, detailed information to make sure that we're fully cited on the pressures and trying to achieve that really difficult balance that you've you've made reference to, and as, as indeed Alison has as well. And I think we got a lot of assurance about how much work was going on behind the scenes to try to address this uh, as quickly as possible and in a safe way. And we also had a meeting last month with the board where we were brought up to date. So that's been really helpful and appreciated. So it's just worth saying that, that, that there's all that activity taking place behind the scenes. Um, I was concerned that we hadn't had any response back, so I'm delighted that you've confirmed that. Um, the only thing I, I would add, though, is that sometimes the Scottish Government aren't always joined up, the different parts that you have to connect with. So just seeking a bit of reassurance that uh, those that sent you the letter and those that you've had ongoing talks with are from the same part of the sponsor department and that you do feel that we are getting a clear steer to move quickly on some of the things that we had to advance now that we're in the next financial year. Thank you, Adam. Yeah, th thanks, Sandy, and thanks for uh, acknowledging the work that's going on. I, I really appreciate that and useful uh, to be sharing that in public. Um, just two comments if that's okay so i think the joined up bit with government is working really well uh, at the moment so the policy teams are absolutely working with us as alongside a really cohesive approach from uh from really from caroline lamb and her immediate reports as, as the the director general so that, that feels good at the moment um and the second comment that, that you prompted me to to think about although we don't have a completed agreed budget there is lots of it that we have got agreement around already, as, as you know, around the, the efficiency and all that. So clearly as teams, we're, at, we're started on that already. So we're not sort of in a complete limbo. It's really around um, a part of the budget that we're, we're working hard on to, to find the best way to, to, do, to do that part. Thank you. Thank you. OK, Sandy. Um, that, that's very reassuring, uh, Alison. And um, yeah, it does reflect the the aspect that we're all in this together so that's that's good that um, you're having that positive in contact thank you yeah and on that point too i'd just like to thank all the people across nhs grampian and are also contributing uh, to, right across the piece to to the financial chapter solving the financial or doing something about the financial challenges uh thank you uh dennis um thanks chair um I'm sure the government are very cognizant of some of the pressures um, 
that we're facing um, uh, as a board uh, financially, but it's the impact on uh, obviously um, patient uh, at the front door to some extent. And I'm just wondering, Adam, if you could expand on our work with partners, especially in the prevention uh, element uh, of maybe trying to prevent people actually uh, arriving at the front door. And I'm just wondering if us, you know, if you could maybe expand a little on how the work is going with our partners, because I think it's incredibly important that because of the financial situation um, is that we, we look more at that sort of prevention agenda. And I'm just hoping you can expand a little on that. Thank you. Thank you. Adam? Yeah, thanks, Dennis. Um, and uh, maybe Susan and others would want to come in here as, as well. I, I think the, the key bit we've got is really the Northeast Population Health Alliance as an officer group that's trying to coordinate activity. And then we're working in really coherent ways through the community planning partnerships that brings in um, all of the partners that are part of that um, long term change in the uh, profile of morbidity for our population. And um, I'm really drawn to the uh, the sort of Marmot Man that, that hopefully folks remember, which describes um, the proportions of things that we need to, the, sorry, the proportions of things that we contribute to a healthy population. And the NHS is an important part, but only part of a bit uh, around all the much wider determinants of health. So um, the working, as you say, Dennis, with partners through community planning is, is really key. And as you know, we've got lots of focus on uh, children and that really good healthy start and the difference that makes child poverty. Uh, and again, I'm sure we'll hear a bit about that later on uh, when we think about corporate parenting. Um, and then there's uh, the national uh, approach towards um, uh, the healthy population is coming out later in the summer and we've had a few um, previews of that uh, and again those are really big areas that we need to concentrate on uh, together to make sure that we we uh, give the best possible chance for people to have a, a healthy fulfilled life and there's there's that huge bit that we're worrying about isn't it of uh, the years lived in healthy life rather than just the length of life. So there's another bit there about working on it. But, uh, you know, the obvious things then is sort of the obesity bit, really key, uh, tobacco, alcohol, drugs, all, all those things. And then that exercise component uh, of supporting the healthy living. So we can perhaps, uh, Su Susan's on my screen now, so maybe Susan can top up with anything I've missed off, if that's okay, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, th thanks very much, Adam. I think you, you've covered everything. Um, I guess the, the other bit just to add um, is that um, in addition to the uh, alliance where we bring chief execs to, together, we've also uh, brought together practitioners through a public health system leadership group. And I'm delighted that uh, community planning managers will uh, come along. And our first meeting together in April is looking at our collective plans to make sure that we are coherent and working together where it makes sense to work to, together. Uh, to try and pick up the pace and scale of the prevention activity. Um, and again, Adam talked about the four pillars. Uh, we're currently um, undertaking presentations with uh, elected member colleagues, and I'm happy to share the slides that we prepared for that, because it gives some examples of what are we doing around the wider determinants of health, how are we engaging in some of the place-based work uh, that Adam's uh, alluded to. Thanks. Thank you, Susan and Adam. I think emphasising the importance of partnership work on this is, is really key as well. It's something that we're, we all need to be involved in that wider prevention agenda across the public sector and, and third sector in the, the whole Grampian area. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's also refreshing, Chair, um, the work that's been happening in it with our uh, general practitioner partners um, be because they're playing a, a very vital part in obviously um, looking at how we maybe do some social prescribing as well um, and I think you know that that's a great piece of work uh, and that just I suppose um, puts that lens on that partnership working but thank you Chair. Yeah thank you I think we, ca we can't emphasize enough how important the partnership working is thank you thank you for that. Um, Ian please. Thank you Alison um, got a couple of, <coughs> excuse me a couple of questions 
I can just echo others and uh, comments about thanks for the vast amount of work that has gone in and is continuing to go in uh, to seeking to achieve a, a, a stable financial position. Uh, first question about the finances and in particular the true expectation is the right word, but if we achieve as a board the, the, the savings uh, I identified uh, of £36 million pounds through efficiency, and that takes us an overspend of £58 million. Pounds. Uh, question is, I think for the benefit of those watching other than myself, if um, this, that level of overspend is, is delivered, so £58 million, or I suppose potentially a bit more, uh, given that the Scottish Government has uh, given us a target of £15 million pounds of overspend, what is the impact on the board of that additional overspend? That's my first question. Thank you, Adam. Do you want to tackle yeah, that first? So Maybe Alex thanks, as well. Yeah, th thanks, Ian. So um, uh, our position at the moment is to continue to work with government to um, not have an overspend at that level for sure. And so, uh, you know, we have a plan in with government, but it's just not quite right. I think the impact on individuals would be much greater than anyone wants. So we're working with government, learning from other health boards with what they're managing to do. Uh, and we're definitely not on our own. I know other health boards are definitely in a similar position. So I think there's really a, a movement as a country about how do we how do we address those things? So it's something we'll keep you posted on um, as we uh, hopefully get that number to come right down uh, and if and if that's not possible in agreement with government then we'll understand what we do at that point but at the moment we're working to achieve the financial target yeah thank thank for thank you for that my second question is about or are about beard and anchor and it's um, it's obviously very very welcome that there are no dates for commission or at least uh, seasons for the commissioning starting I'm not sure if this is a how long is a piece of string question, but uh, I think members of the public might well be more interested in when the uh, both facilities will actually be operational. Can we pass to I'm, June, Alison, if that's OK? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ian, for your question. So we continue to work through that feasibility study we discussed at last board meeting to understand the design review changes. And when we've completed that work, we will know definite dates We because that then programmes in the work. So we'll know dates. We'll have a programme by that point in time. So it's really working with the contractor to get to that stage. And that, that's where we're currently at. So we don't want to give a definite date at this point in time, just in case it's incorrect. So we'll continue to we, we've offered a season at the moment uh, until we get that phased work completed, which should be completed by um, and, and a paper at the June board. Thanks for that. My, my question wasn't so much asking for a specific uh, date for the start of the commissioning work uh, or start of commissioning on, on the two different uh, units. It was how long is that commissioning once it starts likely to take? Yeah, so 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 that, sorry, Alison, just come back in there. Um, so that's been worked up, so that commissioning plan has been worked up. It varies depending on the size of the, the building. Obviously, the anchor centre is smaller than, and, and the transfer across will be different than it is for Baird. It's a bigger serve, more services are going into it, it's bigger. So, so that work is um, being completed as well at the same time. So we're working on that to understand that. And that's a period of pro probably 12 weeks. Um, and I'm giving that as an estimate um, at the moment. No, I won't hold you to twelve weeks, but the, that that that's helpful to to know the um the the, the scale of it. Thank, thanks for that, uh, Alison. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ian, for the question as well. Thank you, uh, Batty. Please. Thanks very much. Um, I think we've heard about um, the extraordinary amount of work that's going in um, to maintaining high standards of clinical staff and. Um, financial governance at a time of unprecedented financial challenges. So I suppose two questions related to that. First, how are services being prioritised? Because clearly there's a tension in achieving all of these goals. And secondly, what can users of health and social care services do to help? Thank you. Two very important questions there. Adam. 
Yeah, I, I maybe just start and then see if uh, Nick or Paul or June or or someone else of the team would would like to to comment as well. So the 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 prioritisation part um, is some of the work we're doing, but not at a not at a whole scale system like we did in COVID. So we learned lots in COVID, didn't we? So we suspended services as non-critical that's created you know an enormous tail so we we're, we're not thinking in terms of that we're, we're trying to think how does how does a team use the res the collective resource it's got less a little bit to design a sustainable future uh, and perhaps the the key bit of work we've got running for that is a group chaired by um uh, by Mark Burrell as the chair of the area clinical forum co-chaired Stephen Lindsay as as the employee director and Susan Webb as the director of public health and um, they've got a commission with us which we've commented on and that's now going through the area clinical forum uh, the GAPF and has been to my, my team meeting um, uh, and that is trying to I think really do the prioritization over a slightly longer term but I'm sure others will will want to comment on that um, uh, and then the second part about what can individuals do um, I, I guess there's the know who to turn to campaign so that people um, enter the system in the most appropriate way uh, and then there's definitely the um, the keep yourself healthy sort of thing that we were talking about before uh, around the broader aims of, of, of our uh, prevention agenda and population health but I'd, I'd be delighted if one of my colleagues would come in Alison to uh, develop that a bit further thank and you and Nick volunteered first so bring Nick in thank you all right thanks very much so so I think in terms of the first area what I think Adam's um, talking about is the idea of stewardship so this idea that at a service level um, what, what what's the best we can do out of that financial envelope and then for us to understand what's the adverse movement, whether that's around waiting or service provision or et cetera, or quality, whatever it happens to be. Um, but I think, as Adam says, I think to try and do that on a whole scale basis across maybe 60 or 70 services and try to rank them, I think is an extraordinarily difficult thing to do. And I think that was the main learning that came out of COVID, um, uh, you know, despite us having generated a huge inventory of what were time dependent critical services so i think it is a much more service based and maybe mark will come in about some of the service discussions on that i'm always thoughtful about questions about what what can the public do to help us i i i, I think i'm going to try and reframe your question which is something about i mean i think this is much more about what can we do with the public to help both of us um rather than sort of coming with an instructional don't do x y and z actually a huge amount of it is that we have a very complex system and we need to do lots of work um, with the public and many of the campaigns that are run say for example over winter are about how do we simplify how information is transferred to the public so that they're able to access the most appropriate care for them at a given time because fundamentally that probably um, uh, complexity, failure demand, um, uh, uh, multiple sort of doors of entry are the things that drive quite a lot of the excess utilisation. And obviously Susan's got a hand up, so there's a huge amount about how we also put in place all of the things around prevention um, that, that sort of, you know, getting ready for winter, all of the campaigns we've done uh, uh, around those sorts of things. So I think that would be my reframing is that I, I, I think what we've usually found is the instructional messages about please don't do X are less effective than the collaborative ones about how do we work together to understand your needs and the healthcare service ability to provide it. Yeah, thank you, Nick. I'll be, Mark, if you don't mind, I'll bring Susan in first before before coming to you, because I think we're, we're on theme here. And I think it's really important not to say you can't, don't do X, but, but what can you do positively? And I think there's lots of things that people can do positively as well. And I'm sure Susan will talk about some of those as well. Susan. Yeah, no, th thanks very much. And uh, just to uh, agree with what Nick was saying um, and, and some of the reasons why people um, end up coming to our services is because of uh, 
social isolation, as the impact of higher cost of living. And that's why working with our partners is so critical so that we wrap around uh, the, the individual and provide them the support. So it, it may be that the door that they come through is through the um, NHS, but, but actually making connects within communities, uh, within some of our third sector, within uh, community planning partnerships is, is absolutely the, the right way forward. Um, the other bit uh, I want to put my hand up for, and, and Batty, you, you know this, that the, the changing needs of our population are much more to uh, multi-morbidity. So I think one of the big challenges for us um, in the work that I'm, I'm doing with Stephen and Mark is how do we make that shift from focusing in on individual services to actually following the interconnects where patients need a number of services around them. And that is a major transformation. Um, and it's one I, I think the, the group are really keen to, to explore and make progress on. But as Adam said, it, it's not something that we're going to do in the next few months. This is a, a, a culture and a, a, a transformation agenda. So uh, look forward to keeping uh, the board up to date with the progress as, as we move forward. I'll come back to you, Batty, later, but we'll answer all strands of your questions first. And I think just what shone out from what Susan was saying, and Nick was saying there, it's, it's partnership and community are both important factors in, in what we need to do and moving forward as well. Um, Mark. Yeah, thanks very much, Chair. Uh, just to come back, really, uh, I suppose, just echoing uh, uh, Adam and Nick's point regarding the you know, prioritisation of, of aspects of service. And I think that that, that group I'm working with Susan and Stephen on, we are looking at the transformational aspect, but we know that, you know, stopping services is just never a great thing to do. And it's how we make those services maybe more efficient. And we, and we look at and you know, it would be helpful to have had that discussion. Thanks. Thanks to everyone. Thank you very much, Betty. Thank you, Joyce. Um, thanks. I was coming back in on the back of what Susan was saying about the multi morbidities. Um, and really, the view that we're taking now fits with the person centred approach that we're supposed to have. Yet we're still sort of looking at things in a service based approach. And perhaps we should be using more of our engagement um, forums that we have with people out there to see what would they like to see rather than what our services would like to provide. Because it's a bit like asking turkeys to vote for Christmas. Um, you're never going to cut the service you deliver. Um, and I think we need to have a, a slightly extended view um, to see what is acceptable to the wider population in terms of change, um, when it happens, how it happens. And what is acceptable in the future, because the future is not going to look like the past. Thanks. Yeah, that, that whole aspect of engagement is, is evolving at the moment, isn't it? But Susan, do you want to, to come in and respond to Joyce? Yeah, and, and I guess it's just to provide some reassurance to, to Joyce, there are conditions where we, we have got patients um, up the middle of planning how we navigate the services we've got. So uh, long COVID would, would be an example of that. And we're currently uh, commissioning a second round of evaluation so that we absolutely understand the things in our system that help but also the things that get in the way. So that will then begin to give us a bit of a focus on what are the things that we do need to, to work on uh, for our patients who require multiple services within our organisation. Thank you. Joyce, OK? Thank you. And Mark? So just to come, come back to that point as well, oh, Joyce, thank you, Chair. Uh, it was, uh, we, were, we were certainly engaging with uh, Luanne Grujon, who's obviously putting that uh, project People First, and she'll be working with us in our commission and actually is going to present to Area Clinical Forum around uh, how the People First interaction is happening so that we are listening to the public. There's no point in us de developing services or transformation if we haven't listened to what the population want us to, to do uh, for them. So that's certainly front and centre of our, our minds, Joyce. Thank you. Yeah, it's a clear focus across the board, I think, isn't it? That that project and, and engagement and how we evolve that as, across the piece as well. So thank you. It comes back to those words, partnership and community being important, and we need to make sure we have the right conversations to, to make that happen. Thank you. OK, I can't see any other indications to speak in the back of um, the Chief Executive's report, which is where we are here. So please, can we note the report? Thank you. And we turn to item six, which is the infrastructure investment plan. And uh, Alan Wilson is going to 
start us off on this one, please, Alan. Thanks, Chair. And uh, following on from your statement earlier, I think everyone is aware of the the different environment we're now in in regards to the availability of capital and how we balance what capital we've got with the risk that we've currently got. So hopefully the board, the paper that's here, uh, the board will be able to see how we're looking to uh, make those decisions in regard to making sure we're prioritising the, the key aspects. So there's a few things within the paper that I'm going to bring Julie uh, Anderson in, who's the Assistant Director of Finance, who produced the paper. However, I would like to just point out one piece of it. You'll see a, a new way of a way of the report in the Scottish Government, and there's two key dates in there in reference to we're working to a whole system planning in the future. A, we're just in its infancy on that. So what I'd propose that we would come back to a future board seminar or session where we could do an in-depth presentation to the board to make you assured that we're commissioning this work and how we're going to commission it and how it'll work through our governance streams. So hopefully that will allow us to give the dedicated time today to the, the key bits of this paper, knowing that that will come along in the horizon, uh, Chair. So I'll pass on to Julie, who will go into some of the key content of the paper, and then we're quite happy, myself and Alex, to support Julie in any questions. Thank you very much, Alan, and that suggestion uh, moving forward is very welcome as well. Thank you. Um, Julie? Julie, you're on mute. Sorry. Um, hi, apologies there. Thanks, Alison. Um, yeah, the report is with the board today for their assurance and, and, and agreement and reflects the five year infrastructure plan that forms part of the medium term financial framework for the board. Um, I draw the board's attention to year one and two of the plan, which is most mature and, and the later years um, we've made a planning assumption around level of funding, but will be more developed as we go through the whole system planning pro process that um, uh, Alan briefed you on there. Um, so fo focusing on the 24-25 budget that's, that's set out in the paper, there's £57 million identified of investment. Um, this will be overseen the delivery of this will be overseen by the asset management group who have that role and the investment includes things like um, a risk assessed and prioritised programme of backlog maintenance and essential equipment replacement uh, and that's reflected again in, in um, anticipated in future years. Um, there's ongoing construction of, of, of our, our multi-agents that say Nort Mortuary and Bird and Anchor, which will be major features of the programme in this coming coming year. The third LINAC will be replaced and then there's, there's obviously the ongoing remedial work of the Labs Link Building on Forest Hill Campus. Um, the board's previously approved some work on the roof and there's further work to be, to be done there. So those are the key features of the spend plan for the for the for um, infrastructure this coming coming year. Um, I, th I think we've alluded already to the funding constraints that NHS Scotland face, and that is also clearly reflected in the outlook for capital funding going forward into future years. And we've had clear direction from government that we should expect to focus on backlog maintenance and essential equipment replacement and, and do planning for major projects but but not to progress those at this stage unless less from board's own um funding allocation and not to expect specific funding allocation over and above that um turning to the recommendations i would just draw the board's attention to a couple of further points um we will consider the schedule of revised schedule of reserve decisions later on today which contains a slight change to governance arrangements in relation to um, a, approval of all programmes of work over a million pounds. What, what we're looking for uh, as part of this plan is, is we've re we're reporting um, the intention to deliver a couple of programmes um, which are expected to be over a million and, and for that to be overseen by AMG subject to being within 
budgetary limit constraints. This is um, it is really part of streamlining streamlining the approval process for these while making sure that the board is fully cited on the planned delivery of those and, and we'll obviously report that in, in terms of updates through PAFIC and the board as as these projects progress. The two in the plan which fall into that category which previously would have come with a, a report back to the board following procurement is the um, plan in 24-25, we're planning for the replacement and procurement of the um, MRI West on, on Forrester Hill um, as the spend is likely to fall into the following year. But having certainty that that's a key commitment for, for the, the the organisation will allow the long lead time around the procurement to progress during this current financial year. Of the areas further backlog maintenance on the link building um, towers, uh, the labs link building towers, which um, we've reported previously on, on the need to do that. Um, the other aspect in terms of the recommendations is in relation to delegating to the Chief Exec and Director of Finance to conclude arrangements around the transfer of the multi um, agency mortuary to ourselves from Aberdeen City Council. Uh, there's a number of what will be contractual documents, things like the transfer title of equipment that's been procured by the City Council during their construction of the facility uh, and, and sort of indemnities uh, around the um, the building that's been constructed, transferring back to ourselves. So we're just looking to 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 give that delegation for for those to be concluded by um, over the course of, of of this year when the facility moves to a place where it's ready to open, um, and, and that that will be a positive um, through through if we have that in place now. So that's me, Alison. Um, happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Julie. Thank you for that very thorough run through of the investment plan there. Can I ask anyone for any questions or comments about anything from either Alan or from Julie? Thank you, Derek. Hey, thanks, Alison. Um, hey, being the sustainability champion, um, I, I hope you won't mind me having a wee bang on behalf of sustainability. Um, there is only one mention of sustainability in a report, and that, that's under the guise of the value and sustainability group's work. Um, so nothing at all uh, about sustainability. Um, no allowance in there for any sustainability works. Um, and it's a it's a plan and there are changes to the way the plan's going to work. Um, principally the as far as I can gather the program initial agreement uh, for for big works uh, and I was wondering if this could include for example um perhaps some determination of how we're going to move forward for a, a full net zero requirement now I know we are going to talk about this in in a week's time at, at the PAFIC committee um but the but the plans being presented here, and we're talking about it puffing next week. Um, and, but sustainability is not mentioned. And to to highlight that, um, the plan will focus on deliverability and a risk based assessment considering physical condition and service continuity. But what about the sustainability considerations? We've we've got a chunk of money. We've got a um, we've got a a, a requirement to deliver on sustainability issues, but there's nothing in the plan for that. And then it talks about stopping development spend unless funded from the local formula. So I, I, I just again wondered if that leaves room for a possible net zero plan for the for the, the whole organization and indeed the wider public sector if we can join with the public sector. Uh, in producing a net zero plan for the northeast. Thank you, Derek. It's very helpful, Derek. Um, Alan, can I turn to you for that one, please? 
Yeah, uh, exactly. And then, as you'll be well aware, Derek, I, I hold two, two hats. So I'm the exec lead for sustainability as well as managing the infrastructure. So I've got to try and balance uh, what's best with both. But what, what I will tell you is the first part of work that we've been asked to do is about how do we create over the next couple of years a longer term infrastructure plan with what we we'll currently have. As part of that, sustainability, environmental improvements will be made aware of what we can achieve when we're working in this infrastructure. So, uh, as I said, when we present to the board at the session, you'll see that that will be through it in some of the decision making. In reference to the specific funding set aside for it, and specifically saying about development plans, you'll see our capital allowance there is, is minimal. It's only scraping the surface. If we have to take any money out there at all mm -hmm. for development of schemes, it's to come out of that money. Eh? And at this time, it was agreed at Asset Management Group that we, we, we just can't do that at this point in time. However, as you're fully aware, I'm working in the background trying to uh, get into other financial streams where we could get some money that will hopefully allow us to do that, Derek. Uh, but uh, I do uh, agree with you in the concerns, given the, the high uh, standard of of, uh, of targets that we need to meet. However, we've got to make that balanced approach in the short term, but longer term, yes, we do need to have that sustainability environmental aspect right through the heart of all this. Thank you, Alan. I'm glad to hear your commitment to that as well. I think it's really important. But Julie, are you going to come back on that before I turn to Dennis, uh, to Derek yeah. again? Yeah, thank, thank you. Just to add to Alan's point, just to, to give the board some assurance that, you know, embedded in a num number of projects that we have delivered, we are delivering on, on the net zero and, and carbon reduction um, obligation, although it's maybe not explicit in the plan. So if I, I look back to last year, last year and, and this year, you know, the mortuary is been, has been designed as a net zero facility, energy efficiency and and, and, and current standards are at the heart of the bird and anchor. We put um, PV tile uh, panels on, on the roof of Rothley Down, which is just concluding its completion. Um, and, and obviously we've invested in Braemar Health Centre, which which had a, a strong sustainability element around it. And, and we're just about to conclude the green space project again, which takes some of that sustainability agenda. So it, it's, it, it, well, well, we've not got a specific line in the plan. Our, our um, planning for delivery and under the infrastructure plan does include where opportunities arise to um, make, make sure that our investment is um, um, deals is sort of green and deals with sustainability. And I suppose the, the other thing which Alan touched upon is that um, a number of external uh, Fund, funding opportunities are are available to draw down on, and, and we're actually um, engaged in those too. And 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 last year we we benefited in relation to our EV um, vehicle infrastructure. Um, so so there's there's a, just to assure the board that we, we do have a range of um, activities under the infrastructure that's contributing to that green agenda. Thanks. Derek, can I come back to you, please? Any comment from what's been said? Yes, thanks. Um, I, I, I am fully aware uh, of the discussions that um, Alan and I have had on this, and um, indeed the Sustainability Governance Group, and I am obviously aware of the report that's going to PAFIC uh, on uh, the, the wider aspects of, of sustainability. And I think um, we're we're all agreed about how we're going to take this forward with PAFIC. Um, so I think that's probably the better place. But I just wanted to make sure that this was a this was um, raised in terms of this infrastructure plan, because um, what comes out of the PAFIC might implement it. You know, this is a, a, a cross back to this particular plan. Um, so I just wanted to make sure it was raised here um, so that there was awareness of it 
and and we will have a a, a full fuller uh, proper debate um, at Puffick uh, next week. I think it is. Thank you. Yeah, Derek. I mean, I, I th thanks very much for raising it. I think there's maybe something we need to capture in in at least in the minutes that, uh, if not as a recommendation, that um, about seeking further assurance about the joined up approach to net zero planning. Um, through PAFIC maybe is the way to, to say that's the appropriate way, even if we just minute it as rather than as a recommendation. I think that's important to do so if everyone's supportive of that approach. Um, Leslie could, could uh, Leslie and Alison could ask that we minute this as something that, that will be looked at then at PAFIC next week, further assurance around net zero planning and a joined up approach. Yes. Thank you. OK, um, John, please. OK, thanks, Alison. I've got two quick questions, it's almost yes, no answers, and then a broader question, if, if I may. Um, first of all, I'm assuming that we don't have any capacity or, or much capacity for sales to raise income for, for infrastructure. That's the first question. Yeah. We do keep a watching brief on that. We are, we are reviewing our infrastructure requirements and going forward in that form part of the whole system planning. Um, but there's nothing specific um, on our books going to be sold um, in this coming year. There may be potential as, as we look to the office rationalisation project to, to dispose of, of, of a number of our facilities and, and we're conscious of that. But in terms of crystallising that within the plan, that not, does not feature at the moment. OK, I, I just think at some point, I mean, not on PAFIC, but at some point a picture on that would be helpful for, for the board to, to understand what, what the potential is or, or isn't uh, around that. Um, the other question is about um, Scottish Government, uh, we're, we're told here, is, is saying um, not to spend any money on development funding um, unless it's in local formula. From, from a local formula allocation, we do have some money in, on page 28, uh, 40,000, I think. So am I right in assuming that there is this local um, formula which is coming into play? Um, Alan's indicating on that one, Alan. Yeah, John, so uh, with what we've managed to do is we've put that set aside, knowing that we've got some challenges in some of our higher risk areas that you'll see that we're spending money in on the programme. So that's to allow us to keep some money aside to keep developing that a bit further. However, that amount of money, although it seems big, 40,000 is like significant on the bigger planning eh, that we would normally have done, John, eh, but it's just a small amount to allow some of the work that we're currently carrying out to continue for a little bit longer. OK, no, I'm welcome the fact that we can do that. I just wanted to make sure we're not cutting across the Scottish Government guidance uh, or, or no. instruction on that. OK, thank you. Thank okay. you for that. Um, uh, can I just ask the broader yeah. question? Um, yeah. yeah, so we're, we're, later on in the, the papers, we have information on the very high risk around infrastructure, which is totally understandable. And I also understand that this uh, plan is within the resources that we're given. So it, it's it's not really within our gift to have um, too much of a developed strategy around this, but that does bring in risks. I mean, we're, we're looking at um, potential need of 662 million um, funding and we're getting um, 120 million. So it's a fraction of what would be needed in a robust strategy. Um, so I'm just wondering about the um, the ongoing problem that's building up because of that, um, doing some maintenance, but but not a lot. And you said at the start of the meeting, Alison, quite rightly, we would want to shape what the uh, estate is going forward across the system and that needs to be part of transformation which we need to look at so it would just be a picture of of that risk and and a bit more of an understanding of of the implications of it uh, so i understand for this particular paper this is a plan for a set amount of money 
and I, I'm, I think we can probably be assured on that, but it does leave this broader question hanging for me. I'm just wondering if you can get any comment on that, please. Thank you. Alan, do you want to? Yeah, yeah, no, back? John and, and Will picked up and it is, you know, you've highlighted the numbers there eh, and the disparity. So it is, so there's a couple of things from it. So you'll see the first, the two timelines I spoke about earlier. To, the, so the first timeline is January eh, 2025. It, we need to have a plan into Scottish government. So that'll be a strategy just to, like you're saying, to show what, funding is needed just for us to keep the current infrastructure up to a suitable condition over the next four or five years. Now, everybody on the board are well aware that some places were beyond that because we have got failed infrastructure. So again, that's up to my uh, role to try and push with Scottish Government and highlight that, that, you know, the money we're getting isn't there enough and we need more and we need it quicker than what they're establishing. So we will be lobbying and we will be pushing for that, John. But I think the key, the second key bit is there any positive that we're taking out of that has to relate in what you said in regards to transformation. And uh, Adam's mentioned it and, and Susan's mentioned it and Nick and, and June. And I think we've got to grab a positive out of this is how we shape our services. And then we've got an infrastructure plan at the back of it to support how we're going to move our services on. Normally, what you would have done is done it individually and in individual services, and you would have done pieces of work out. What this will do is allow us to look at a whole system change, which would include change to service, and allow us to then work with the infrastructure, whether it's existing, new, or changes to it, and or use of other infrastructure within our, our uh, public sector or, or for sector A. So I think that there's one positive out of this. I'll give us time to work on that over the next two or three years and hopefully come out with a clear plan. The bit for me, John, is that the funding we will need for that, no matter what comes out of that, will be, you know, an extreme amount of money. Eh? And uh, that's a bit currently. So all we can do as a board is highlight our needs and make sure that we're signed up to what we're needing, then it's it's up to us to continue that dialogue with Scottish Government when they're providing it over the range of time we need. But the longer it goes without investment on our estates, as you'll see in the, the risk that's coming up later, eh, we, we are sitting in a high-risk environment in some of our facilities, and that's a piece of what we're trying to do just now, is to keep them safe in an environment suitable for patient care. And that will be the challenge over the next day, two or three years. You know, I will I will say that, John. OK, thank, thank you for that. So what comes to mind is, you know, as that um, work is done and then gets reported to the board, is perhaps seeing some scenarios, because I can imagine all the health boards going with their huge begging bowl. It's going to be a massive amount and we're only going to get a fraction of, of what might be the overall need. So maybe some some articulation of the scenarios and what that will mean for transformation will be really helpful. So thank you for that. And I'm, I'm assured um, if that, that's going to come through in future reports. Thank you. Thank you. And linking it to the wider priorities of NHS Grand Prix is also absolutely key as well in, in how we're moving forward with things. Alex, do you come in on that point? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, we've had the outlook from the government in relation to where we think the, the level of funding is going to be over the next, wee, the next, next while. And I think what, what we've got to do is to kind of strike that balance between, um, you know, a lot of that money over this point of time is going to have to be spent on maintaining the assets we've got to keep them operational uh, and also to um, um, thinking about that, the equipment that, that we need to replace. You know, if we step out of there, we will need additional funding. So if another project was to come in uh, at a bigger scale, then we would be we would be reliant on additional funding from that. I think the, the key thing here is I'm thinking about the long term strategy and I think John's kind of highlighted that. I mean, we know what the outlook is um, over the next next, you know, the short term, but things might improve over the medium term in, in terms of capital funding. And we as an organisation need to be in a good place uh, to be able to react to that. 
Uh, and I think that's what one you know one of the strong points of uh, of the work that Alan and the team are doing around about that is that it'll put us in a good place to react if funding does become available, uh, um, so that so that we can maximise the the benefit from that. So I, I think you know the strategy is there. Um, we are where we are, uh, and we need to kind of work our way through that as best we can. But we can't lose sight of how challenging this is going to be over the next few years. Thank you, Alex. And the other thing drawn out in the paper as well is that it's a longer term plan to engage across service portfolios and across the whole system approach with, with partners and with the third sector as well. And it talks about engagement beginning across the piece. I don't know if you just want to have a comment from, from Alan about, about plans for that engagement uh, around infrastructure, around the wider system and any barriers foreseen in that kind of work. No, so j just to confirm, and that was a piece that I would like to come back, a future board to go into the detail of it, Alison, but just so that the board's aware, we've started that process. I've got allocated resource, a significant allocated resource on driving this forward, working with my other colleagues within the a executive team. We're naming individuals, key individuals that can, and it can support that. And then, uh, then we go out to the wider, where it's place-based review and that, on how we're going to shape it. So yes, that'll all come out. As I say, we're at the early stages of the planning on how we 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 are going to do it. However, we've started that work, and hopefully, within the next couple of months, I can come with a, a comprehensive presentation on all the different aspects of it to give the board assurance that we're heading in the right direction. And any barriers that are there, we're foreseen, and we're able to get assistance to to bring them down, Alison. So that's the plan yeah. going forward. No, thanks very much. That was very really important to link that with what John's just been asking about as well. So, so thank thank you for that. OK, I can't see any other indications at the moment on this. No? OK. Um, we've had an item from De Derek Minuted about further discussions are happening on the net zero planning at PAFIC next week. So, so we're aware that that's happening. That's in the minutes. Can we turn to the recommendations themselves on this paper? Um, we're asked for assurance around, around what's in the paper. We're asked to decide that the infrastructure investment plan, as, ref, uh, as reflected in the medium term financial framework, and note delegation to the asset management group for delivery of the programme. Um, we're asked to delegate to the Chief Executive and Director of Finance Authority to conclude arrangements associated with the transfer and operation of the new multi-agency mortuary and to endorse the process to agree priorities for longer term investment plans on a whole system basis in line with the new NHS Grampian clinical strategy. A plan for the future is underway and will inform future development. There are um, a series of recommendations on this one. Can we agree all of those, please? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, and then moving on to item seven, the Grampian Joint Health Protection Plan. Turning to Susan Webb, please. Susan, to introduce this plan, please. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks very much, Chair. Um, and absolutely uh, delighted to have the opportunity to shine a bit of a, a light on the work that uh, health protection colleagues do with a wide range of partners uh, to protect uh, the, uh, the health of our, our population. It, it's uh, pre-COVID, it, it was largely unseen, but there is such a breadth of, of activity um, that being able to take uh, board members uh, through the report is uh, appreciated. Just to set some context and then I'll hand over uh, to Chris. Um, our, the, the Public Health Scotland Act that places a duty on NHS Grampian uh, to ensure that we have uh, robust uh, procedures, services in place uh, to fulfil a wide range of duties. One of the requirements is for us to publish a joint health protection plan, which is coterminous uh, in our case with our three local authorities in Murray City um, and Aberdeenshire. Um, Previously, the, the plan has detailed uh, the uh, uh, capacity and the activity, but in collaboration with the Leaders Group for uh, Public Protection, they've requested that we also include in the plan a more strategic uh, a, 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 a approach to the work that we are undertaking. So a, a slightly different uh, format uh, to the work, and I will hand over to Chris to, to take you through the report itself. 
All right. Um, thank Chris. you. Morning. Uh, morning. Morning, uh, Chris. Everybody. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, Chris Littlejohn. Um, I am a consultant in public health uh, with NHS Grampians Health Protection Team, um, and I am the head of protecting health in the public health directorate. Um, so the, the joint health protection plan that you have in front of you, it's for 2024 to 2026. Um, and uh, that duty uh, in relation to health protection relates to communicable and environmental infectious hazards, um, as well as uh, chemical, radiological and physical hazards um, in the environment as well. Um, and the rule of thumb is generally taken to be we're talking about hazards that people as individuals aren't necessarily able to avoid um, by themselves. Um, so there are numerous hazards, of course, that we uh, uh, put in our own way. Um, so our, 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 our choice, our lifestyle choices, um, but uh, health protection then is protecting the population against um, these kind of uh, hazards um, that by choice um, are, are not necessarily easy or, or indeed possible um, to avoid. Um, as Susan says, we've set the plan out then um, it broadly in, in two sections. So the body of the plan is set out with a much more strategic view. Um, so thinking about those hazards through the lens of the four population priorities set out by the Chief Medical Officer and um, Susan as Director of Public Health um, uh, together. Um, and then into the appendices of the plan um, are the uh, sets of information um, that Scottish Government request um, be included in joint health protection plans in the guidance um, that goes alongside the Public Health Act. Um, so the body of the report then, so it's thinking about communicable and infectious diseases, it's thinking about chemical, radiological and physical hazards um, under these, the, under the lens of these four broad areas, um, the climate emergency, uh, inequalities, uh, the sustainability of uh, health care uh, and social care, um, and then specifically um, uh, with a recognition um, of the, uh, the, the ongoing challenge um, associated um, with infectious uh, disease. Um, the, the, the climate emergency, um, the, the, the hazards uh, 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 highlighted there, um, and obviously a, a challenge um, for all of us and all of our partners um, to be engaged with. Um, under uh, inequalities, um, well, we have long known, uh, at least since the, well, I was going to say the social reformers of the the 18th century, but actually go right back to classical times, um, uh, people's living circumstances um, in, uh, affect um, the susceptibility uh, to uh, infections and uh, harms from uh, external uh, hazards. Um, and uh, I, I must admit there is there, there has been a, a certain degree of Dickensianness um, in terms of finding ourselves yet again talking about um, uh, uh, bolstering our response to tuberculosis and preparing clinical colleagues to be able to treat diphtheria um, and measles, um, diseases which we, I think we we had all hoped um, were consigned to the history books, but which unfortunately are clearly not. Um, and of course, there's a degree of new threat um, identified in terms of vector-borne diseases. Um, uh, which may uh, come our way and, and indeed we can already see spreading in our direction. Um, uh, in relation to health and social care services, so it's, it's, it's clear that this is, a, this is a, although the duty is on the health board, in terms of protecting our population, um, it, it does require um, an entire system, um, both between NHS, the integration authorities, but also out into local government and other agencies as well. Um, thinking about um, uh, animal and plant health agency, thinking about health and uh, health and safety executive, the Scottish Environment Protection Agency, the Food Standards Scotland um, agency. Um, so, so all of these partners involved in this endeavour to protect our population against these hazards. Um, uh, and uh, even within the NHS, then it, it's reliant on uh, people being able, people 
the, the consequences of hazards being able to be identified through clinical colleagues, um, through the availability of microbiological uh, and otherwise diagnostic laboratories. Um, uh, so, so it does it does require um, a robust and sustainable system um, in order for this work uh, to happen. And under infectious um, hazards or the, the infectious challenges, um, we've highlighted three issues um, uh, in there, um, and because it's important to recognise the long-standing work um, which is going on against these. Um, so the, the the challenge of antimicrobial resistance, which is upon us, um, uh, the pandemic, the need for renewed pandemic plans, um, uh, and that may make your heart sink as much as it makes my heart sink. Um, but the the realization that the fact that we've been through a coronavirus uh, pandemic um, has not shifted. Uh, the risk of an influenza pandemic um, from the number one uh, risk register slot for the UK. Um, so we need to be we need to be ready for next time. Um, and uh, uh, and the importance um, of vaccinations, um, which uh, which um, uh, colleagues are uh, doing sterling work um, in terms of helping to protect the population against vaccine preventable diseases. Um, so that's the that's the broad overview of challenges, and then, like I say, through the appendices, then um, uh, are the some of the operational details um, as required by Scottish government. Um, there, there is having everything I've said there. There's an, an awful lot more that we could put into these appendices in terms of the multi-agency endeavours. Then, but this is the requirement from Scottish government um, in terms of uh, local resources, local plans, local arrangements. Um, and our uh, approach um, to the hazards um, that our population face. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. That was really comprehensive run through of the report. Thank you. Uh, Dennis. Um, thanks, Chair, and thanks, Chris. And, and once again, it, we seem to be highlighting the importance of that sort of partnership approach um, to our public health. Um, I, I'm just wondering, uh, you mentioned vaccinations there, Chris, and I'm just wondering um, if we are starting to get to the point that, that people are kind of shying away from it to some extent. It's been sort of vaccination overload to some extent. And I'm just wondering if this is maybe a cause for concern, especially towards things like influenza. Um, and I suppose my other point would also be in terms of infectious disease with the um, climate changes we're experiencing at the moment and with the horrendous uh, sort of storms and rainfalls, et cetera, we're getting. I'm just wondering if there's going to be an increase in uh, airborne um, diseases like E. coli and, and, and aspects like that and whether or not, you know, we've got enough uh, resistance in our system to be able to sort of manage a, any increase within those particular areas. But I suppose my main point is really the, the sort of the vaccination um, a element because it, it would appear, whether it's anecdotal or not, but it certainly would appear that, that people are starting to sort of drift away from the importance of, of vaccinations uh, pre-COVID or post-COVID. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, um, I, I might defer to Susan as our director and the chair of the vaccine transformation program. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I actually, I actually think, um, I, I think we can be generally reassuring in terms of we across the board. On average, we have got very good uptake. I think, I think people do still understand the importance of protecting their children um, against uh, uh, vaccine preventable diseases, um, and 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 the and the the uptake data. Um, uh, supports that. I think it, it has always been the case whenever you offer something, you will get variation in uptake. So certainly um, we know that there are, we know that there are uh, groups within the population. We know that there are geographical areas within the population um, uh, that, 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 that demonstrate that variation. Um, and, and of course, I guess one of the things I, I, I do agree with you, sir, that in terms of the COVID experience, was it did bring to the forefront um, quite a uh, quite a a, a, um, a, a, a a minority, but a verbal minority 
um, who spoke out um, against the idea of um, vaccination in principle. Um, uh, and, and I think that has always been the case. Um, and, and I guess I guess the, 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 the other worry that we've got is um, in terms of the so-called Wakefield cohort um, that again, as we see um, after after measles was declared as eliminated in the UK, um, that we see the resurgence of measles across across the globe, across Europe. Um, but of course, we've got um, significant outbreaks of measles now across parts of England. Um, and so we know that we have inherited um, a, a strata within the population who were not vaccinated. Um, however, um, I, I, again, I would just I would commend the work of um, uh, colleagues um, working under Susan's direct leadership um, around the vaccine agenda um, uh, and in terms of uh, increasing uh, uh, increasing both the messaging around the importance of vaccination, increasing public trust in vaccination. Um, but generally speaking, um, the, the data does show us that there is still a general faith and general belief in the in, in the broader population uh, in the virtue um, of vaccination and the protection that it offers. Thank you, Chris. Just bringing in Susan in, can I mean, just add a question around accessibility of vaccination as well? I mean, are, are we doing enough to make everything accessible in, in the programme as well, Susan? I'll just throw that one in and bring you in as well. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. And uh, thanks for the question, Dennis. I, I think that often there's um, perception, isn't there, because because people do, are talking more about vaccination, but actually Grampians COVID and uh, flu uptake um, is slightly higher than uh, the, the Scottish uh, uptake. Um, but we did see an increase of 1.1%. So actually we have seen an increase in uptake in the flu and COVID. But as Chris has helpfully highlighted, there is variation, there's geographic variation, communities of interest. Um, and we uh, also, because we've got quite a robust uh, data programme, we're able to identify those those areas and cohorts of our population. And we've got what we what was termed uh, nationally uh, our inclusivity plan, and we've got a work underway. And in the How Are We Doing report, we highlighted that, uh, particularly within the city, uh, we were below uh, the Scottish average for uptake for uh, childhood uh, vaccinations. And we've had uh, an improvement programme working with uh, health and social care partners and others, uh, community planning. And I'm pleased to say the latest, latest data has seen an improvement in our position. Um, partly it was data. Um, because of the migrant nature of our, our population, but partly it was how we make sure that our offer is accessible. And uh, I, I was saying to uh, a, a meeting this week, I remember taking over the vaccine transformation programme and we were talking about going out to communities and people said, oh, we can't do that for infection prevention control. And now we are able to do pop up clinics. We do them in workplaces. We do them in communities so we can be really, really responsive. So working with uh, our colleagues in the uh, Grampian Racial Equality Council, we're able to identify what might be the barriers and if it's required, we can offer pop up clinics. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you for that, Susan. Thank you. Um, the only ask... element I was going to say, say chair, sorry, Chair, I was going to say the only element uh, I was maybe asking Chris or Susan to, to, to focus on is that impact that we're maybe having with climate um, in terms of uh, our population and whether or not, you know, or readiness is there um, to pick up things like, uh, as I say, maybe, you know, because of E. coli or whatever. Uh, I'm just wondering, you know, if our plans are robust enough to actually um, respond to that a uh, challenge. Perhaps Susan. just around the corner. Yeah. Susan, could you comment yeah. on that? Yeah, yeah, and certainly. I mean, I'll maybe start with the community bit, and um, Chris might want to say a little bit about some of the work around the private water supplies, which I think you might be alluding to. So, in terms of through our uh, Grampian uh, Local Resilience Partnership. Um, there is a programme of work looking at uh, community resilience. So that are that is essentially looking at the consequences of some of these adverse weather events. 
but equally the work that we're doing through our community planning partnerships, through the local outcome improvement plans, is absolutely uh, um, picking up on issues around uh, climate change and virus environmental sustainability, both what we can do as organisations, but what individuals can do for themselves. So the work that's going on around active travel, for ex example, um, gives an indication of, of some of the actions that we are taking forward. But I'll hand over to Chris to see if he wants to say something specifically about E. coli. Um, yeah, so, so I mean, that, that's, that is the entire point, isn't it? I, mean, I think you're, you're hitting the nail on the head, which is the, 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 the coming storm of the climate emergency and the consequences of that. Um, and the, the the potential additional demand and strain that the that that um, the, the consequences could put uh, on on all of our systems. Um, I mean, in terms of E. coli specifically, so there are we know that um, the northeast of Scotland has got one of the highest levels of private water supplies in the country. Um, uh, so people are reliant on uh, boreholes um, uh, and other sources uh, for their for their domestic water, uh, rather than being able to be connected to the Scottish water public water supply. Um, and we know how easy it is for those um, the, the the filtration and the disinfection systems for those private water supplies. How easy it is um, for them to be forgotten about, or for them to be for them to be neglected or for them to, for in, in some cases, um, for people not even to necessarily realise that they are on a private water supply. So there has been um, a long standing programme of work through our uh, local uh, government colleagues um, in terms of registering private water supplies um, and uh, a programme of routine sampling um, uh, uh, to to check on the, the wholesomeness of the water supplies that are within them. Um, and it, it's a matter of um, routine practice, certainly, um, that uh, as part of our response to cases of E. coli, um, that one of the one of the potential exposures that we consider is uh, private water supplies um, and uh, ensure that investigation is actually done um, to make sure that that is not the source of somebody's infection. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. OK, Dennis. Yeah, yeah thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, three, three more indications to speak. Um, at Bert, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, this is a very important piece of work, so thank you very, very much for um, the paper. Um, my question is around uh, the consultation um, that's uh, been part of the drafting um, of the plan. So the paper tells us um, that it's been drafted by the, the, the Joint Health Protection Coordinating Group, and the paper goes on to describe some of the groups that have been a part of that. Um, I notice there's no reference, for example, to the likes of the Fire and Rescue Service um, and potentially the police service uh, who may not have um, you know, an overt involvement in uh, health protection, but certainly in relation to some aspects, uh, primarily I'm thinking about CBRN issues, um, they certainly have a role in relation to protection there and also prevention. Um, so I'm just keen to understand um, the involvement of uh, these agencies and uh, seek confirmation that they've been part of the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Bert. Chris? Yeah, thank you. Yes. Um, so the uh, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, our blue light um, services are front and centre um, in terms of the immediate response to uh, uh, many of these kind of environmental hazards which are flagged um, in this uh, plan. Um, and the importance then of our local and, re and regional resilience partnership arrangements. So we do have from NHS Grampian um, uh, uh, links across both through um, health protection um, and also through civil contingencies who were all involved um, in the creation and the drafting of this plan. Um, so it, this plan should have gone out through uh, the local resilience partnerships um, in terms of the ability to get feedback. Um, it, it's an it's an ongoing. I mean, it's an iterative plan. So this is a, there's a requirement for it to be renewed 
every two years. Um, and I think what that gives us um, is the opportunity to continuously engage um, and develop and improve our uh, arrangements. And indeed, one of the actions which is within the plan is to uh, renew um, our public health incident plan, uh, which will take all of this into scope and to actually use that renewal of that plan, which hasn't been done since before the pandemic, is to renew that um, and that will that that will uh, almost that will certainly 100% um, involve uh, those partners through the local resilience plan as well. Um, so yes, it's a, it needs to involve our local resilience planning partners and our health protection and civil contingencies inputs into those partnerships are the conduit by which this plan uh, was taken uh, through that for consultation. Thank you, Chris. Susan's just come in, I think, on this. Yeah, just very briefly to say that um, the Commission through the Leaders Group for Public Protection, clearly Police Scotland are a key partner on that group. Um, and the, the, the frequency of that, that meeting has significantly reduced. So we, we've actually taken uh, this plan to the Northeast Population Health Alliance, where both Scottish Fire and Rescue and Police Scotland are present and, and they um, endorse the plan. So whilst Chris highlights, there's always more work to, to do and we absolutely do it on a partnership basis. It's just to confirm that that we have worked closely with them. Yeah, thank you. Bert, happy with that? Yeah, I, I did have a question I was going to come back to Chris about and, and maybe it's you know a bit pedantic and perhaps Susan has clarified this for me, but you know in Chris's response um, when he referred to the resilience group, which I'm aware of, um, he said this this plan should have gone there and and the pedantic bit of it is well did it go or should it have gone but perhaps susan has clarified that in relation to the um the higher level group that she's referred to thank you thanks susan's trying to come in there thanks susan yeah, just to come back, uh, it, um, it was agreed that the Joint Health Protection Plan would go to the Leaders Group for Public Protection. Uh, I think what Chris was referring to is within the Joint Health Protection Plan, there are some plans that are absolutely part of the suite of plans of the local and regional resilience partnerships and, and uh, work is in progress. That's part of the action plan. Um, and it has gone to the Northeast Population Health Alliance before coming here. So hopefully that 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 helps. Thank you, Bert. Thank you, Susan. Uh, Joyce, please. Um, thanks. Yeah, I was just I'm pleased to see within the plan in relation to the health inequalities part, there's some work on health literacy. Um, not just um, I'm I'm aware that it's very important in relation to vaccination, but um, with the recent increase in things like measles and um, I've recently heard you know I heard about bed bugs increasing and um, other and there being an outbreak of scabies in Aberdeen and these are things that you know most of us haven't heard of in our life so there's generations of us who are unaccustomed to infection that has been passed on from person to person and probably that side of the literacy needs to be built up in the younger generation who have no idea about the fact that these things exist can be transferred and how they can be transferred so it's, just looking for assurance that this is all going to be part of the health literacy that comes out and the messages to the population. Thanks. I don't know who wants to answer that. Susan, do you want to come in? I think the short answer is uh, yes, um, and I guess the work that we are doing um, with community groups and with behavioural scientists is, is making sure that um, how we put these messages across are appropriate and land well. So yeah, I can give you that confirmation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dennis, are you coming back? No. OK, <laughs> the legacy hand. Well, thank you. I, mean, I think it was a really good comments on that paper and a really important point, but as people have said, it's good to see the partnership work shining through this as well. So thank you very much, for, uh, Chris and Susan, for presentation. Turning to the recommendation, we're asked to endorse the proposals in the paper. Um, can we agree the recommendation, please? Thank you very much. Thank you for agreeing. Thank you very much, Chris and Susan, again. I'm going to take a 10 minute comfort break now. It's 11.30, so if we come back at 11.40, please. Thank you. OK, welcome back. It's 11.40 now. I hope you've all had a, a, a good, good break in the time. We're turning straight away now to item eight, which is the Corporate Parenting Three Year Action Plan. I'm grateful to Caroline Clark coming to present the paper deputising for Geraldine Fraser. 
Thank you. Caroline. Hi there. Um, I've also got Tracy Davies, who's with me, who um, who also um, supports the corporate parenting. So um, Tracy's here to answer any questions as well. Um, so you'll remember that in December um, last year, I brought the corporate parenting annual report um, to the board. <clears throat> and at that point, I had said that we would bring the um, the action plan excuse me, to the uh, to a future meeting. So this is um, our three year action plan. So runs up to 2027. And um, I'm just trying to find, sorry, I'm just trying to find the cover paper. And that's what happens when you have too many windows open. Um, so um, you will notice that there is a cover paper and there is the action plan to so two papers. So the cover paper. So basically this report um, aligns to our corporate parenting responsibilities um, and which is a legal responsibility that we've had since 20, um, 2015. Um, so this action plan will be an iterative action plan um, and you'll notice that a lot of it um, relates to um, things that we need to do going forward to ensure that um, that we're complying with uh, our legal duties and the duties set out for the board within uh, the Scottish Government, the promise document. Um, you'll notice on the cover paper, so draw your attention to um, 2.3, where there are two key risks around. Um, well, there are two things I want to draw your attention for. One of the risks, um, our key risk is around our support unaccompanied asylum seeking children. Um, so you'll see there 2022 NHS Grampian received requests for 22 initial health assessments for um, this group of children. And in 2023, this has increased to this increased to 80 and so far um, in the first two months, January, February, we ha had received 10 requests. So it's looking like that um, that demand is um, continuing. And what I should have said actually is unaccompanied asylum seekers automatically become looked after children and as such we treat them um, the same as we do our care experienced children and young people. Um, and then you'll notice on the second bit, um, the second bit of that 2.3, the promise self-evaluation. Um, that is really about us making sure. So the corporate parenting responsibilities are one thing, but there's the but there are other things that we need to just double check. So the self-evaluation is in progress and we we need to further um, ensure that we're able to we're complying with our um, promise. Um, so the only other thing that that you will be aware of, of course, in two two point three point two, um, this group of children are children, young people are particularly vulnerable and likely to have complex physical, mental, and and social needs. Um, and meeting the needs of these children is an additional strain. St um, strain on what is a very small team, and that's why um, we try to ensure that we're we're really broad with our um, our corporate parenting responsibilities apply to all of us, um, and can't just be done by one team. So the action plan itself, um, you'll notice that the corporate parenting and it's just Grampian Corporate Parenting Group um, created this action plan. And it's a sub um, a subgroup of the children's board. Um, so you'll notice on the first page um, we outline um, specifically things around United, the UNCRC rights of the child um, and how it relates to the children's board strategy and their priorities. Um, the second page outlines um, a number of actions that we will take um, to ensure that we are over the next three years to ensure that we are um, complying with our, our requirements as well as the um, complying with the promise. Um, so I wasn't going to say any more than that. I've highlighted the two things that I think um, you need to be aware of, but I really wanted to open it out to discussion. Um, the, so a final thing actually is that um, I did have a request earlier um, in the week about the data about the 
and numbers of children um, that this re relates to. So just to give you some updated figures, um, so we've got approximately 1,140 looked after care experienced uh, children and young people across Grampian. And um, the split of that is 173 for Murray, 407 for Shire and 560 for city, so you'll you'll notice that um, proportionately the city has um, a slightly higher proportion um, uh, than um, Shire, and then Murray, as you would expect, have got um, have got less. So so yeah, that's that's the the data. So open to you. Thank you very much, Carolyn. Thank you. I've got Sandy and Joyce both wanted to come in. Sandy, please. Um. Thanks very much for that, Caroline, and um, just maybe just um, raise a few issues for yourself. And, and I think Tracy's got the short straw, hasn't she? OK, um, so firstly, I'm very pleased to see this in the sense that um, I, I don't think any of us would have an issue with any of these ambitions and high level actions that, that are, are set out before us. So. Um, so that's good. But I think Alison said at the beginning of the meeting in terms of everyone having responsibility in relation to corporate parents. Um, and part of my responsibility will be seeking assurance on that golden thread from those high level ambitions through to actually making a difference to these uh, very vulnerable children. Um, so I think what we have before us is a start and lays the foundation, but I think we've got a long way to go. And I, I just wanted maybe just to highlight a few things that when it comes to PATHIC eventually, that I'll be I'll be looking for to seek assurance on. Um, firstly, I suppose I, I would want us to move beyond quantifying plans and um, evaluations and so forth to actually getting more of a sense in terms of how do we measure performance in relation to making an, an impact. So how do we know actually we're improving the lives of these children and young people? Um, so I wanted us to get away from just simply stating how many processy bits that we've had uh, and look at how do we measure impact. Um, and that, I suppose, comes on to my second point, which is um, I'll want to know more eventually about engagement and participation and communication. Um, those young people are the experts in terms of what works and what doesn't work. Um, and I think organisations across Scotland are surprisingly poor at being proper partners with young people and to hear what they have to say, because often they have some really clever solutions which don't take an awful lot of resource or money. Um, the, the third thing is in relation to um, working with other corporate parents, the, um, organisations such as Who Cares wouldn't just say that's good practice, they would remind us that that is actually part of our statutory duty to do that. And I notice that, that you have referred to Caroline uh, in your introduction um, about uh, NHS Grampians Corporate Parenting Group, which has um, membership of health and social care partnerships and local authorities. I think if, if it comes to PATHIC, I would want to understand a little bit more what that looks like and what actually, as a group of corporate parents, we have actually been able to deliver on the ground, which is different and actually works. So I think that needs to come to life a little bit. <clears throat> and I suppose the last thing, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm rabbiting on, I'm sorry. But the, the last thing I, I wanted to raise, and you kind of picked it up, uh, at the very end, Caroline, and I suppose it's for everyone that's on this uh, call. Um, I, I think it was a bit odd when I when I read 2.3.2 about how vulnerable these children and young people are and meeting all the needs of these children is an additional strain on what is a, already a very small team. That absolutely misses the spirit of what cor corporate parenting is meant to be about. It has to be owned and embedded throughout the whole organisation. And I suppose at PAFIC, I would be interested to hear what your colleagues have done to make sure that we've moved forward from purely aspiration to business as usual in relation to good practice. So it's what are the steps that are being taken to make sure that all the parts of the system are very much awake and alert to what needs to be done for these young people and change their practice accordingly. 
Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. That last point reflects what I said at the beginning as well about every one of us on this call is a corporate parent, yep. a parent as an individual as well. So each one of us also has a responsibility to be aware of as well. Thank you. Just before I, I thought June indicated there to answer that as well as um, as well, as well as Tracy, I thought, but Cutsy announced, yes, June and then Tracy. But just wanted to add to the engagement as well. Um, I suppose thinking about how we're engaging with young people, just a question around, are we doing it in terms of both promoting health and responding to illness, or we, are we just doing it in terms of the young people that come through our doors at Forester Hill or wherever, and, and are we missing out that that wider bit around health when we're engaging? Um, but I'll turn to June first of all, then Tracy can follow. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and, and, and Sandy, questions are really pertinent and it just made me think about a piece of work that is ongoing at the moment in, um, with, in relation to the Royal College of Nursing and we're working with the foyer where we will see young people who have been in uh, been care experienced uh, and looking at employment opportunities by working via a cadet scheme with them. So I think that's showing you in action, the, you know, the, as you're talking about the processes and things, but that's showing you as individually, we, we all have responsibility around this and we need to think of ways, not just for anchor organisation ambitions, but also uh, to, to support the promise and uh, our corporate parenting. So I think this is a good example of it, thanks. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, yeah, I just wanted to come and respond to some of Sandy's comments around um, particularly engagement and participation in our partnership working. So we've actually got some really great examples of engagement with children and young people through our corporate parenting work. So we we have representation from NHS Grampian on our um, champions board. So each local authority partnership has a champions board and we have representation from NHS Grampian on those. Those agendas are set by care experienced young people. So they they have that space to tell us what, what's important to them and what they want us to, us to know about. That also aligns to strategic corporate parenting groups within each of those partnerships as well, all of which feed back into our children's board. So we've deliberately set up our children's board action plan to align with all of that and to come under the umbrella of you know the promise to UNCRC so that, so that all of that filters through. We very recently did a specific piece of work through our partnership networks asking um, young people just to, to get a baseline of where we were as an organ, where they felt we were as an organisation in regard to preparation for the UNCRC and Corporation Act to come in in July. And we particularly focused as a part of that work on groups of young people who were looked after and care experienced. So we have very current um, views from them as to how we're doing and um, how, we, how we're doing and what they expect from us going forward. There's also been some distinct pieces of work, such as um, we did a, a bit of engagement work to look at care leavers, so the 18 plus um, age, age group, because we know that within health we don't have a specific funded resource to support those, um, those young people under the umbrella of care experience, if you like. Um, so we wanted to know what their specific health needs were so that we could respond to that. We also got some funding from uh, the Scottish Government almost two years ago now to deliver a birth parents project. So that's lived, understanding the lived experience of birth parents, all of who have been um, care experienced themselves and have been through um, you know, that, that those experiences of, of living through care. Um, and that was about addressing generational change and then being able to sort of you know break that break that cycle and learn from that. And that's that's been a really high impact piece piece of work. So just to give some reassurance that there has been um, an awful lot of engagement work going on with this this group of um, young people we probably need to sing about it a bit more and that's not been possible because it, that, that's not that wouldn't have been possible without the partnership um, arrangements that we have in, have in place so just a bit of reassurance on the on the engagement there for Sandy. Thank you very much Tracy. Sandy do you want to come back? Uh, that's really helpful I mean I suppose my point is the report didn't give me that assurance and and I've had to ask um, and I think June your point I mean you know I think we could have several exemplars in relation to what what that has translated to in terms of change practice what we learned from it are we rolling it out are we replicating it in any way that sort of thing is really helpful and I think it's helpful to hear about the board uh, Tracy and the agenda being set by by, by young people, but my, my question in terms of assurance is, so what? So what has that resulted in, in terms of changing our approach and our focus on, on, our, on our practice? And, and I think it's just that's joining up our, our ambition to what's actually changed. I, that would be really, really helpful. But I, I suppose, I think it is potentially really exciting and it will hit the spot 
But I think when it comes to profit, that's the sort of assurance I'll be looking for. Um, but but definitely we're on the right direction. Thanks, Sandy. Thank you, Joyce. Um, thanks. Just following up with what Sandy's saying, I'm I'm very keen that we not just listen to the voices of care experienced young people, but also give them the opportunities they would have if they were our children. And I think the, the programme that June's running with FOIA is great, but I think we can go further because we're the biggest employer in Grampian. So we should be providing work experience, not necessarily long term work experience, but a couple of hours a day, an introduction, because some of these children don't know what work is, they don't know different trades, they have no idea what people do in work, what working in an office means, what working um, in the estates department means, what it means to be in a kitchen. Um, and we could take these children and give them some introduction and sometimes these sparks will change a person's life and we badly need to change these children's lives because they have a very poor outlook at the moment. Thanks. Thank you. Six. Susan, are you coming in on that point? Yeah, it, it was just to add, and, and maybe maybe Adam would want want to come in um, as part of our anchor work. We've we've undertaken a baseline just to get a sense of what we're doing. So we absolutely have captured some of the good practice, but uh, but I totally agree with Joyce. We need to scale that up. So those are the conversations we're having through the local outcome improvement plans through community planning. Thank you very much for that assurance, Susan. We look forward to seeing things developing further as well then. Um, Sandy, is that legacy? I think that's really helpful. And just on Susan's last point, I, I suppose the bit that always gets me a little bit anxious is that when um, agencies and public service are under so much pressure like they are just now, particularly in relation to budgets, and all are all trying to square that circle on their own rather than working in partnership, then there are people like these vulnerable young people who lose out as a result. So it is that bit about we have to keep that momentum going. It makes an awful lot of sense in the longer term. Um, and any progress in relation to that, that would be really good. And evidence you can give us as, as non-execs would be really important because I know whether it's PAFIC or the IJB or speaking to council colleagues, um, I, I will certainly be challenging in relation to things that need to, we need to do more of. So um, that kind of conversation, particularly between ourselves, is really, really helpful. And thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Joyce, are you contending the answer as well? Yeah, thank you very much, Joyce. Right, I can't see any more indications on this paper then. So we have a recommendation around assurance. Can we agree the recommendation on this paper, please? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Moving on then to item nine of the paper, the strategic risk management report. I'm going to turn to Nick Flat, please, to lead us through this, please. Nick, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair. So I'm delighted we've got Jennifer Matthews with us, who's our corporate risk advisor, who does all the work and also prepared the paper. So I'm going to hand over to Jennifer to give a few of the highlights and then we'll take joint questions together afterwards. So Jennifer, away you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, good morning, just everybody. So I'll just um, give some highlights from the paper as Nick's described. So just to let the board know that the process concerning strategic risk and organisation and how we look at and manage strategic risk is well underway. So this is an updated process that commenced last year. And just to give a, a highlight of that, it really um, begins with the chief exec team who have executive responsibility around the management of risk. So they have formal review activities um, at their meetings where they discuss and scrutinise the activities around the risk and also how the risks are, are framed to ensure that we have a good reflection of the, the most significant risk that the organisation is exposed to. Um, and following on from that, we have the risks aligned to the individual board committees. So that commenced in January and we are getting moving with that predominantly in April and then into May this year. So we are expecting the board committees again to have oversight of these risks, to scrutinise the management activities and the assurance processes around the risk. And then the final stage of that is the risk going to the Audit and Risk Committee. And within their remit, they have um, oversight of the Strategic Risk Register in its entirety. So looking at it as a whole and also, again, having that oversight of the management activities, the assurance processes and ensuring that we are able to gain assurance of the activities. And if we're not, it's addressing the gaps um, for these activities. 
So to say that the process is well underway is, is great, but time does need, we do need time to, for these processes to become embedded um, into our existing practices. So I think it's important to highlight that, but nevertheless, it's great work. So I'm um, just picking out a few points from, from the paper. Uh, there are a few risks that you'll be able to see that are currently under development. Again, that's just processes um, within the chief exec team to ensure that risks are reflected in the correct manner and so that we can focus on the right controls. Um, just highlighting one risk, uh, the cyber risk. So there's been a, a change in personnel. So we're looking at that in a little bit more detail, ensuring that the risk is articulated in the correct way and also scrutinizing on our controls across the organization. Um, as you're aware, it's, it's a very vast topic. So there's a lot of focus on that at the moment and that will be coming back to the chief exec team at the end of this month. So focusing in on um, a couple of the risks that are rated as very high, um, this, uh, these are really reflecting a, a, an increased exposure to the organisation. So that's specifically with infrastructure risk and also with the um, focus on the planned and unscheduled care areas. And just picking up on, on that risk, it's risk 3065. So there has been a recent agreement for the chief exec team to actually divide this risk. It's very large in its scope. So we, by dividing this risk, it's hoped that we would be able to gain the focus that's required in these two areas of, of high level risk. So specifically within planned care and unplanned care. So there is work ongoing with developing these two individual risks. So there's a lot of formalities around that, around articulating these risks. And there hopefully we'll be able to get a really good focus on controls and ensure that we have the right people around the table for these conversations. Uh, so a new risk that is in development, it has been to the chief exec team a couple of times, but really um, there's been a lot of conversation around this is around um, citizen engagement risk um, led by Susan Webb. Um, so again, a lot of work and it is, I, I've seen a copy recently, it is looking really good and very focused. So that will be coming back to the chief exec team soon and um, hopefully will spark some really good conversation on that too. So that is everything I wanted to highlight from the report. Um, hopefully seeing the strategic risk register in its entirety will um, hopefully give the board a good reflection of, of our focus on risk at the moment. I'm happy to hand over to Nick for any comments or any questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. Chair, I'll just pass back to you for questions, I think, because we've got quite a few hands there. Yeah, thank you very much. And just thank thank Jennifer and yourself, Nick, for, for all the work on this ongoing development around risk as well. I think it's clearly come on a long way over the last few months. So so thank you. The clarity is 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 there for us all now. Um Sandy, please. Sorry, sorry, that's legacy a legacy. Legacy still, thank you. Mark, please. Uh, thanks very much and thanks for the paper. I think it's very well presented and, and it really made sense to me when I read through it and I think it's been a lot of work going into that, so thanks very much. I, I suppose, and, and there's not going to shy away from it, that uh, Strategic Risk 3065 is obviously going to be a massive concern to, to anybody that works within the, the health and uh, in social care settings. The division of the planned and unplanned, unscheduled care, I will say, will bring some raised eyebrows, I suppose, with regards to how that's going to work, as we know they're independent or interdependent sometimes. And I suppose there is a statement that you won't lose sight of the fact that they don't want to work in complete isolation, but we must make sure that they are joined up with regards. That was the only sort of comment I had regarding that. So just wanted some assurance around that for us, if we could please, Nick or Jennifer. Thank you. Chair, I'm Thank happy you. to come back in on that, if that's helpful. Yeah, uh, yeah that, that is very much recognised, Mark. I mean, I think the thing is that we we all understand that they're quite different bits of health economy that are going on, but are very codependent as well. Now, what's not going to change is in terms of the board committee alignment. So those two risks, for example, are aligned to more than one board committee and our intent would be to bring them in harmony together so that there's the opportunity to see the interaction because you're absolutely right but I, th I think the advantages though are that they are one so big in terms of the territory they cover but also the specific um, outcomes that are adverse outcomes that are associated with them um, re really sort of need 
individual attention so that it's clear that we as a board are addressing those. So within the unscheduled care environment, some of these outcomes, which are largely related to delay and queuing across our system, whether that's in terms of ambulances or whatever, are, are quite, quite different in terms of a framing than the outcomes of delayed in terms of planned treatment. Although fundamentally under it, both of them are about sort of delays in terms of taking people through a system. So recognise um, uh, the concern and um, hopefully by keeping the alignment right with the board committees, we'll not lose that sort of codependency. Okay, Mark, you want to come back? Can you? Nope, that's that's fine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much, Nick. Um, Derek, please. Hi, right, thank you. Um, I think it's really interesting to see this new system bedding in, and it does appear to be um, beginning to show fruit. So, uh, well done to Jennifer and to Nick for that. Um, on the paper. Uh, on risk 3068, uh, which is on page 66, 65 of the of the papers. It talks about, has identified that the 75 beds, additional beds are on occasion not fully utilized. Um, now, I think that needs to be investigated uh, urgently. Um, I think it was Paul came forward with a, a a paper which was very persuasive in its case for additional beds. Um, it, it was such a, a persuasive paper that it makes me feel, well, why aren't these beds being used? Um, and I just wonder if there's a, uh, if there's a communication breakdown or something in there that we need to, we need to look at to, to, to see what the, what the issue is. Uh, moving forward on that, it, it's difficult to argue for extra beds, and we obviously need them, I think. It's difficult to argue for extra beds if we're not using those that are available. So that, that was a point, and a, a more general point uh, on the appendix where we've got the full uh, list of um, risks. Um, it's very helpful if in that type of uh, circumstance, if the any changes and any new pieces are, are shown in highlight rather than just in the plain simple text. And then you can see how things are, are, are progressing and it's dead easy to pick out the new bits and, and, the, and the changes. So I think that would be very helpful as a piece of housekeeping moving forward. But the main point, of course, is about the additional beds. Thank you. Thank you. Nick, do you want to answer that? Yeah, please? I'll come first and maybe Jennifer can pick up on the um, issue in terms of the highlighting. Um, so um, completely uh, appreciate the comment, Derek, it's very helpful. So um, I guess there are a number of steps in this is that we absolutely understand that our overall system capacity is lower than we need it to be. And that is what has underpinned some of the work in terms of bed based review, system capacity and a growth in that. However, within that, and this this might um, speak to some of the splitting of the unplanned, the planned and the unplanned risk strategies. The the additional space that we're also generating is is what um, is non-standard bed spacing as well. And obviously, we want to get to a stage of eliminating that. Now, where the space is within your system um, might be within your unplanned pathways. It might be within your planned pathways, or it might be in one service or another. And so there is a tension in terms of maximize, maximal utilisation of all space is that where what you have available might be non-standard bed spacing in a surgical area and one's all, already running a system where in the medical area one is um, boarding patients into surgical areas. The balance between um, the safest choice at that point in time between moving another person into a non-standard space in a surgical area versus expanding what is done in the medical area is a tension that is managed day to day. And I think the result of that is it, it's apparent from a lot of our review work that maximum utilisation in a really complex economy within a hospital is actually pretty difficult. And part of that is feeding into, so what is the next step about bed-based review and bed utilisation? Um, and, and that, you know, there are lots of potentials in that. 
but I, I fully appreciate your point and I, I think it's very valid that we should be um, uh, answering and addressing the question about why we're not maximally utilising space um, that we have made available in the hospital. Thank you, Nick. I think Paul's coming on that as well, please, Paul. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Derek. And really, 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 really good question to pick up on it from the paper. Uh, and I think some of the some of the uh, explanations touch on many of the things that we've already discussed, including uh, the complexity with which people come. Um, uh, and that complexity with which people come, for instance, to the medical uh, section uh, of the acute hospital ARI, often come with multiple uh, demands and supports required. Not all of these additional beds uh, across the, the footprint are necessarily able to provide that level of package that goes with the care uh, in those additional areas. So there, there are for sure uh, areas that are underutilized. The precise reason why, as Nick has described, there's a preference and that constant uh, risk assessment of, of, of keeping somebody here as opposed to somebody over there uh, is actually quite an interesting challenge to unpick. Um, uh, and there are multiple factors underlying it, I suspect. But some of that is also due to what's available uh, around the immediacy of that bed or that patient, in, a, in other words, as opposed to what's not available somewhere else. So it's, it is uh, something that's been looked up uh, and uh, picked up on. Thank you very much, Paul. And we, Derek, we... Content with that? Yeah, I, I, I find it interesting. Um, uh, it's clearly a difficult issue. But if we're going to make the argument for the next stage, which was what, another 200 beds or something, we've really got to show that we need them. And yeah. I, I, I absolutely accept this is the difficult situation, but we need to we need to try to find a way around this if if we can uh, as quickly as we can yeah. really thank I, you I agree. agree with that i was just going to bring jennifer in to answer the second bit but was that nick coming back on the first bit yeah could i make just a a, a tiny comment so not to uh, go on so I, I think the bit of assurance i would like to give if we look across the whole piece in terms of utilization of space that we have a core space we still utilize it over 100 percent um, during the daytime. So, you know, it's a really complex economy. Um, and what we're talking about is actually about the sort of expansion type of space we've got available that we have built into our contingency arrangements. But overall, our healthcare space utilisation is, is really pretty much at the maximal level comparatively across all of the boards in Scotland. Thank you. And June, are you going to add to that? As well, are you coming on? Yeah, just, just to add. So, um, I think this is what Derek's saying. So, the 75 bed spaces, Derek, are non standard bed spaces that we, we have developed to ensure we can increase the capacity. And the whole bed base review and those additional beds is to, to, to transfer that away from not having those 75 and having a, a appropriate a standard bed spaces in place. So, so although we're not using the 75 non-standard ones, all our bed spaces and the, the 32 that we opened are absolutely being used. So just to provide that assurance around that. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much, June. Thank you. And Jennifer, um, highlighting bits in the report, Jennifer. Yeah, just yeah, very, very quickly, just to come um, just provide an additional bit of assurance. I did speak to one of our chief nurses yesterday about this specifically, and it's absolutely a priority to um, gain understanding around this situation. And Derek, very good point about highlighting any changes. I will take that on board. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, let's move on to Dennis, please. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, and, and I suppose the first thing really to say is to is to commend this paper. I mean, it's 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 a great piece of work, and I think, uh, as others have said, um, it, it's come a long way. But if I can go back to maybe some of the complexities, um, and, and Nick's highlighted maybe around the planned and unplanned. 
uh, in terms of that risk element and the complexity. And I'm just wondering, in terms of that holistic approach, um, how, in some respects, are, are we going to be able to identify where the pressure points are? And, and if we do, and if we try to alleviate some of that, does it have unintended consequences somewhere else? Um, and does that then just add to that sort of complexity? Because I think one of the elements that we need to be aware of is it's the impact it's having, not on just on our staff and our patients, but some of our external partners as well. You know, for instance, you, you mentioned the queuing, Nick. Uh, and again, you know, I think there's a, enough evidence there to suggest that we've got ambulances queuing up and if they're maybe spending maybe 40% of their shift time in a queue, that's not good use of their time and it's certainly not good for our patient uh, uh, care as well. So I'm just trying to understand how we're going to address that from a holistic perspective and whether or not we need to um, present a paper, well, for instance, to clinical governance uh, in terms of taking this forward um, in, in order that we can come back to the board and provide them with reassurance that everything is being done that can be done at this stage. Thank you. Thank you. Nick, please. Can you yeah. yeah, thank you very much. So I think the holistic approach really goes back to um, appreciating the full pathway of care that's involved in these different economies and how they interact. So from an unscheduled care point of view is we, we clearly have a whole um, uh, suite of places that um, people in, in the public are able to turn to. Um, and um, our work is to maximise alternatives which deal with people's problems more quickly, locally, closer to home. So there's all the work around that. The, the second issues are then obviously in terms of then when, when someone identifies um, a problem is that we stream them to come to the best and the right place so we get the sort of um, uh, uh, absolutely the right people in the right place and there's lots of pieces of work around that. Obviously then the, the, the last bit is the um, uh, movement out from the pathway into having patients um, uh, getting back to their homes and getting to other care environments that are appropriate for their ongoing care. And that's a piece of work for that. And then sitting alongside all of those things is we have to have systems and processes that are as simple and as efficient as possible to answer all of the questions, a bit like Derek was placing. So I think the holistic approach is, a, it is really important. And at the same time, we do absolutely have to address very specific hotspots with a clear idea about what are we doing, let's say around ambulance, very long delays, we need to absolutely mm. say what we're specifically doing in that and then put it in the context that actually the bits of improvement work span our whole system and many different elements. Now, again, the planned care economy um, has some different shapes to it in terms of tempo time and those sorts of things, but many of the principles are very similar. Um, they just just occur at different time points, often involve different partners, but fundamentally we're trying to do a similar type of piece of work, which again, and, and Paul and his colleagues um, are absolutely leading for the same objective in that we're trying to identify how do we get the best outcome for someone in the most appropriate way. And when you're sort of queuing within a planned care system, it may on the face of it feel as though it's less urgent, than in an unplanned system, but in terms of clinical patient experience and outcome, um, often there's there's uh, they're very similar that you're trying to deal with. Just the tempos are different. So hopefully, at clinical governance, we'll be able to show that in the context of all of the improvement work. Um, let's say, for example, against the un unplanned pathway or the unscheduled pathway, in its sort of holistic nature across our system. Thank you, Nick. I'll just bring Paul in as well on this, I think. Paul? Yeah, please. Thank you. And I think this this uh, question uh, and what we're discussing does go back to Mark's uh, earlier question. And uh, I think one of the things that we've um, uh, discussed in some detail 
particularly myself and, and Jennifer and Nick around risk, it is, is really understanding the real pinch point, the root cause analysis, the, the blockage point in how you have adequate mitigation and control and move the risk. Uh, and I think what we've been able to now do um, is start that inquiry process by actually separating the risks. Because for some time, it's become increasingly clear that the amount of control I may have on a risk which is planned care is, is very limited because we haven't really understood the nature of that risk as we do now. And I, and I think this separation will allow us much greater granularity in our understanding, which will then allow much better precision to where you put your controls. So, so I think we, you know, I think it's going to be a very, very helpful uh, uh, step. And uh, it doesn't sound very complicated separating something out, but gosh, uh, I, I think it's going to be very effective. Thanks. Thank you, um, Dennis. Would you like to come back? Um, just to say that I'm very reassured that there's ongoing work, and I look forward to. Um, uh, um, hearing more about it, uh, and certainly from a clinical governance perspective. And I'm sure that in terms of coming back to the board with that reassurance in the future um, will be key um, to, to understanding where we are within that risk element. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And I think we're going to have a very valuable discussion at clinical governance about the holistic approach. So thank you. Uh, John, please. Uh, thank you. A couple of questions. The, the determination of what is within or without um, tolerance what what's that assessment method that that comes through on that that's that's one question and then the second one probably links to what dennis was saying in that holistic approach but i'm thinking about those of us who are then in other parts of the system on ijbs um, looking at it from there is is there going to be benefit or is, is there a need at all to try and develop a, a risk approach across the system across the pathways to make it easier to to join that bit up and the consequences or the implications or or not. I'm just thinking maybe that's making it easier for us when we're appearing in different places, but that joining up um, strikes me um, in principle to be beneficial. But. Thank you, Nick, please. Yeah, I'll, I'll come in first. I'm going to pass um, the first question to Jennifer because I think it's a really important question because it, it's been asked quite a number of times. And, and there is a, um, a very clear answer, actually, um, uh, but but in terms of understanding what's baked into our system and what is what comes in terms of judgment. The the second point, uh, uh, again, I'm going to do a deflect here and, and say that Adam might want to come in on this because I think this is absolutely right, because you're completely right when we're talking about the risk across the pathway, absolutely different partners at different stages, the decisions they have to make or make against the risks they are holding absolutely translate to risks that are felt in other bits of the pathways. I mean, we have a very strong dialogue with Scottish Ambulance and um, where the um, risks that we both hold relating to delay in terms of bringing people in, that's really, really important. But in the same conversation further down the pathway, either downstream or upstream, there are important conversations that could be had with within the um, uh, community setting as well. And I think some of the work that Adam's trying to do to bring those conversations together um, beyond actually the partnerships, but across the, the council areas, I think is really important about sharing um, financial approaches um, and risk and those sorts of things. So maybe Adam wants to comment on that, but I'll pass initially back to Jennifer in terms of the um, question about um, top uh, limits. Thank you, Jennifer, please. Thanks, Chair. Um, OK, John, so the, you know, how do we determine something that's out with tolerance? So this this comes down to, to two aspects, really. And um, one of the main aspects is the score that the risk is given. So every risk within our system, um, well, some are scored on different mechanisms, but the ones that we we feel are strategic or um, operational in nature are scored determined on the NHS Scotland risk assessment matrices. So they're they're given a score based on the the potential impact and also the likelihood of the risk occurring. So that score is really 
taken and benchmarked against the organisations of risk appetite. And of course, the, the new risk appetite statement was set by the board last year. And this score allows us to determine um, where it really sits. Um, and that's how we can determine whether it's um, within appetite, whether it's within tolerance or just out with tolerance. So each category of risk has its own threshold. So it's these thresholds that we use to determine this. And I think it's important to say that, you know, how, you know, why are we using the risk appetite and, and why do we have it? So one of the important things is obviously to set um, the board's intentions in terms of risk, how much risk we're willing to seek and how much risk we're, we're willing to, to tolerate. And that's coming back to that word of tolerance. It's also used as a way of allowing those who are responsible for risk to determine how best to respond. So we can use these thresholds, we can use how the organisation wants to um, manage risk and tolerate risk as, as a means of our response. It might allow us to see, well, we need to um, differ our response, we need to increase our resources around the response. So it's, it's really a mechanism for management um, and also decision making is a really important one as well. So it's it's that's why I, I say, especially our conversations we, we have with um, the chief exec team, getting the right risk score for each of our risks is an important factor because it's it's bigger than than just the, the insular concept of where the risk is. I hope that um, answers your question um, and it's not too confusing. It's not the easiest topic. <laughs> I think John's just coming back in, I think. Yeah, no, I think that helps in, in Nick picking up the, the kind of score and then the assessment piece. So I think that has articulated that helpfully. Thank you. Thank you. And Adam, do you want to come in on the wider, wider bit? Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Alison. Um, yeah, John, I, th I think Nick set it up really nicely. It's really a work in progress, I, I think. Uh, and I would kind of concentrate on two bits uh, in, in just building a little bit on what Nick said. So the first bit, I think, is how the three health and social care partnerships work together under the um, governance of the integration joint boards. And there is the bit of work that, that I know you're familiar with, but I'll say out loud for those that aren't, of what, what are the opportunities for the integration joint boards to work together or to share things or to not or to have separate, you know, different bits. So, so, so I think that's a, a, a really important bit of work to think about that join up and then I think the join up between um, NHS Grampian and the Integration Joint Boards Health Social Care Partnerships and indeed the councils it is is definitely a work in progress and has been um, you know I guess partly rethought about relating to uh, the very difficult financial position that everyone's in and how do we actually plan more collectively in both general terms but in specific terms about how uh, particular financial things uh, work within a big complex system that's all inter you know interrelated so I'd say it's a work in progress John and may maybe something that uh, later in the year I'll, I'll be able to say is, is progressing well but we're just at the at the sort of start line of doing that uh, I think in this current iteration thank you Pam do you want to come in on that point as well um, whoops, sorry, uh, just very briefly to say that um, in terms of managing the risk across the pathway, I think that's where um, the portfolio structure has been absolutely key. So we sit um, in um, portfolio arrangements across a wide a range of areas um, which do um, uh, reach into the, the ones where we're managing significant risk. So for example, around unscheduled care, around and, and my area around mental health. So it's just to say around that um, that risk management that actually there is the underpinning of the portfolios where we jointly look at the whole pathway and look at where we can manage the risk to best and, and the and the services and the capacity we have to the best effect. So it's just to give that reassurance on on that more operational level. Thank you. Thank you, John. Would you like to come back on anything? No, I think that that's helpful. I think it's useful to have the, the discussion and articulation of this because whilst it's a work in pro progress, it helps us to to tune into it and 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 help contribute to our common wavelength around it. So thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, it's very useful to have an understanding of where we are now, but where where we're going as well on that on that development work. So that's very helpful indeed. Thank you. All right, I can't see any other indications on this paper, so we're asked. Um, 
to confirm assurance can be provided that improvements are being made and to endorse the updates within the register. Can we agree those two recommendations, please? Agreed. Thank you very much. Moving on then to item 10, the revision to standing financial instructions, schedule of reserve decisions. Um, Alex, are you leading us through this? Yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you. you, Chair. Um, yeah, I'm just going to say I, I recognise that to, to some people, that, you know, this governance framework, financial uh, instructions and, and, and so on are perhaps not the most exciting of topics, but they, they really are crucial uh, in, in relation to how we, we deal with financial challenges and the financial governance of this organisation. So I'm really pleased to have this um, uh, before, report before us today. Uh, and, and I think um, there's been a substantial engagement with this in, in, in advance of this meeting, and, and there's been substantial changes to these documents. So I'll just pass over to Julie, who's going to run us through a, a very quick uh, presentation on the major changes so the board are, are fully appraised of that. Thank you very much. Julie, please. Yep. Um, I'm, I'm conscious that many of you have seen this before, so I will try and keep it as brief as possible. Um, the report that you have in front of you has two recommendations, one, one to consider it and scrutinise it for assurance, and the other one is to approve two of our key financial governance framework documents, the schedule or governance documents, not just financial, the schedule of reserve decision and the statement of financial instructions. Um, these have been updated and I'll just take you through the process. Um, we last updated these in 2020. What we've undertaken is a route and branch, branch review to review current um, requirements of the organisation and, and current um, legislative and, and policy environment. Um, we have extensively engaged topic experts across the organisation in, in the redrafting of, of these, and I'd like to thank those who input into that. There's been wild, wide in consultation with users at, um, who are named with specific roles within in the document to ensure that both it, it reflects what they are currently know they're doing authorising and that they are aware of, of their roles in relation to this update. And fi finally, in, ter in terms of development, we, we considered it through Audit and Risk Committee who have, over who have that responsibility for overseeing governance arrangement and they have commended it for um, to, to the board for consideration. Um, after today's Friday, we, we receive approval. There'll be a launch um, of communication and, and training throughout the organisation um, to to ensure um, understanding and, and compliance. And we will reinstate the annual review, which should hopefully be uh, you know, much, much less an exercise going forward. Um, so just in terms of the documents that are here for approval, um, we normally do a triplicate of standing order schedule of reserve decisions and, sh and standing financial instructions. However, it, back in um, 6th of August 2020, the board uh, adopted the model standing order template issued by Scottish Government and following review, there's, there's no need to update that further because it's so fit for purpose. Um, schedule of reserve decisions are our corporate governance protocols that provide a high level summary of delegated responsibilities from both to the board and to um, across the organisation to executives. Um, the process that we've gone through is to refresh the format, introduce a matrix and responsibility, um, a matrix clarifying responsibilities and cover arrangements. We've also realigned the responsibilities um, where appropriate. For example, the Director of Infrastructure Sustainability, who has taken on the board role of Chair AMG and, and, and um, Medical Director ha, ha, now has a role at, around risk and information governance. And that's reflected. Also created a, um, within the SA, the SORD, uh, additional role in relation to SRO around major projects to make make governance and administrating those projects um, s smoother. Um, we've also introduced a, a section on IGB formal direction. Now that has always been a, a requirement from IGB's 
where they required us to undertake activities on, on their behalf to issue formal direction, but it hasn't been formalised in our corporate governance documents, so, so that's been introduced. In, in terms of the schedule of reserve decisions, we, ha we haven't made a num many changes to the underlying delegated limits and, and authority um, within it, but there, there's a few key areas that where that has been refined. Um, back in 2019, the government delegated to, N to NHS Grampian responsibility for approving um, projects up to 10 million. That had previously been five, uh, 3 million. There's been standardisation across capital transactions, and you'll see that within the documents that were circulated prior to the meeting. and and, and um, and, and finally, as I mentioned earlier, the, the incorporation of capital approvals by the board during the consideration of the annual plan has been incorporated. Moving on, the last slide is the standing financial instructions, which detail the financial responsibility policies and procedures to be adopted by NHS Grampian staff and non-execs. Um, that again has gone through a refresh, a reordering of chapters and removal of duplication to, to reflect current operational arrangements. It's add, we've added in a section around subsidies and grants, which was, was a, a gap previously, and, and those are now featuring more in our day-to-day -day business. So, so useful to include that. We've rewritten the charity section to better reflect the distinction between the two entities of NHS Grampian Charity and NHS Grampian. Um, no specific changes to um, delegations or, or anything like that, but to provide clarity and also to align with the operational arrangements for, for the charity. And then finally, the, the other key aspect that feeds through standard financial instructions is um, refreshes around procurement and tender arrangements to reflect current um, regulation and uh, particularly following the departure from the EU. So that has got undergone a, a substantial. So, that's me. I don't know, Alex, you, you maybe just wanted to tell the presentation, yeah. did you? Uh, thank uh, you, Julia. I think we could take the presentation down. That'd be great. Yeah, I just want to say that this is a, a full and comprehensive review of these documents. I mean, essentially, they've been rewritten. And, uh, you know, the, the, I just want to go on record and thank Julia and Grant in particular for the work that they've done on this. It's been an immense amount of work to get it to where it is. Uh, I'm really pleased with with the progress that's being put uh, in, into getting this this far, and we're happy to take any comments or observations on the on the documents before they're finally hopefully finally approved. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Alex. I'll reiterate those comments about thanks to Julie and Grant for the work on this. I know it's been a tremendous amount. Thank you, uh, Dennis. Please. Yeah, just just like yourself and Alex, just to um, express a. Uh, Thanks um, for the refresh in the documents. Uh, certainly, a much easier read. Uh, maybe not exciting, but um, certainly a, a refresh, and it was very welcomed indeed. Um, I, it's, a, it's a question I had posed before, and um, uh, uh, because we're at an open meeting, um, I'm just wanting to highlight the aspect of the training that you mentioned, Julie. Uh, and how that's going to be rolled out uh, in terms of uh, ensuring that staff are very much aware of where we are and what is required in moving forward. But again, that's going to be inclusive of any um, training for maybe some of our partners, especially along the IGB uh, area. And I'm just wondering if you could maybe um, just provide a wee bit more detail around that. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, Julie, please. Yeah, ha happy to. Um, it, uh, I suppose I put under the heading of communication and, and, and training. So we, we we do have a plan to publish, as said in the paper, these documents uh, and, and communicate that update out to the organisation through um, daily brief, a few, a few articles for the daily brief and, and then through um, how we we land it on our websites, so we'll our inter will be in external. They'll be published on the intranet, but on our intranet, we we will 
maintain them and provide gui additional guidance, um, both through the gramping, the forthcoming gramping guidance update, and also within self-service developments within the finance and procurement web pages. So, so, so that that will feature in terms of formal planning. Um, we'll, we're refreshing the information that forms part of the management development programme that the organisation has. We are undertaking development sessions with our finance and, and procurement colleagues. We've got that scheduled and, and they will have a role in cascading this guidance down and we're providing we're preparing supporting materials to allow them to have that business partnering relationship with, with the wider organization to to ensure awareness and, and and to some extent compliance as well um the chief finance officers of the igb form part of that finance training program um and will also reach out to ensure that um, these changes are appropriately communicated to igb and health and social care partnership um staff so Thank you very much. Me. Thank you. Yeah, that's awesome. very helpful. Um, thanks, Julie. And uh, just finally, um, can I just say that I really did welcome the refresh in the NHS charities paper. Um, it, it, it's, it does make it much more simpler. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dennis. Thank you. Um, Derek, please. Hi, thank you. Um, just to uh, highlight that this has been through the Audit and Risk Committee uh, and had a reasonable um, uh, scrutiny at that committee uh, and and also again to highlight my thanks to uh, Julie and Grant for their time and effort to help me through this and uh, educate me on some of the points, <laughs> difficult points on it. So thank you guys. Um, I wanted to uh, raise a point on the paper. Um, the, the paper makes a, a point and I'm on page 77, and it's in relation to the uh, model template for board reports. And it says there is no requirement to update at this time has been identified. Now, I've been asking for some considerable time that the template should be modified to include a section on um, climate change and sustainability in the same way as we include equalities, finance, legal, and all the rest of it. And uh, uh, it's, it, to me, I, I, I can't understand why we're not doing that. I would quite like to see us change the template to include that particular uh, piece. So just to note that um, I'm asking for it, uh, just, just because it's in the paper saying no um, requirement has been identified, I would disagree with that. I think there has been a requirement identified, but just to note that, that's all. Thank you. Yeah, I, th I think the answer is relating to, to ongoing work on that, actually, but I'll pass to Alex if it's hand up first. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, I think Derek will take that one and 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 we'll we'll go away and have a look at that 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 report um, or the the standard report again uh, and and see what we can do to update that. So we'll we'll take that point on board and 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 we'll go away and work on that behind the scenes and and potentially come back with a new a new format in in due course. Uh, thank you, Adam. Yeah, it, it's just to add to that, um, Derek. I think w when we had a paper at the board. I'm going to guess it was sort of September, October last year, and um, Paul presented the the sustainability plan. Um, I, I think the gap we've got for everyone to do it is the expertise to fulfil that. So maybe we we just get a start on it with the full understanding that the, the depth that we'll have in the team to be able to um, make those assessments is is in its nascent sense of um, ability, stroke, capacity aspect as much as bit. So if, you, if we think about most of the sections we fill, um, most of the teams do, mo sorry, most of the individuals who author the papers do most of the work on that. Whereas I think in the sustainability bit, that wouldn't be feasible quite yet. So we can, we'll absolutely take that take that on board and, and we'll work on it. But maybe that's the, the, um, the little caveat as we, 
all collectively look at that and get get used to how that will work in in reality. Thank you. Can I, can I come back on that? Um, there has been some work Adam done locally uh, by a lady called Deb Jani working for uh, Gillian Evans, I think, and she's done some work on that. So it's not as if we're starting from zero. There has been some local work on it, and I do think through the National Sustainability Champions Network that the government is doing some work on this as well. Uh, it just seems to be taking a long time. So it, I don't think we're starting from zero, and I do accept and understand that there's this uh, need to know what we should be putting into that, um, and people generally don't know, but that, that is part of trying to um, put sustainability into everybody's day job. Yeah. And, and I, I think it's an opportunity for us to do that. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, it relates as well to the point you made at the beginning of the papers as well, doesn't it, about, about sustainability in the infrastructure paper. Um, I, I think at the beginning there were, it was difficult because we hadn't got a sustainability plan. We've got that now, and I think that's the ongoing work from that stage onwards. We're we're on that journey and working to it. So I totally agree with you on the importance of it, Derek, because as I did when you mentioned it before, but we do need to, to, to move forward from that position that, of knowledge that we developed when we had the plan. And obviously there's more work being done on sustainability next week at PAFIC as well, and that will help inform everything. But Susan, you're just coming in on this as well. Yeah, and it was just to say, because I, I think Adam's point around it, providing templates, you do run the danger then of it being a bit tick box. And, and so the work that we're doing around integrated impact assessments for board papers, I, I think the environmental component of that is really critical. So certainly a joint piece of, of work and happy to uh, pick up uh, with you offline just about some of the work that we are doing to take this forward. OK. Yeah, yeah, Eric's thumbs up there. Thank you very much. OK, so um, this um, paper 10 then uh, that's been presented to us, we have recommendations around assurance and decision. Can we agree those recommendations, please? Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. OK, that brings us on to item 11, the forum and integration joint reports. Um, first of all, 11.1, .1, the area clinical forum. Um, Mark, would you like to comment on this paper, please? Uh, thanks very much, Chair. I think the only couple of things that I'd like to highlight from it probably are uh, drawn about the uh, Allied Healthcare Professionals Committee's concerns about the withdrawal of the uh, speech and language uh, therapists and the impact that's going to have. And obviously that was highlighted Quite widely, quite discussed, uh, I think, previously, but it was just brought up as again as a concern. And obviously, this is the real life impacts of our financial situations that sometimes will have impacts further on down the line. So I think that was brought up. And the other aspect was it was nice uh, for I wasn't at the meeting. I must admit I wasn't chairing, but my vice chair was there. I think Alex came along to present the uh, finance updates as well. And I think it has been acknowledged that the communication uh, of the financial problems uh, that are uh, obviously with all of the boards uh, has been you know, communicated very well to the area clinical forum and to the other advisory committees. And we, we commend that aspect and, we, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions that would be posed about that. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Any questions for, for Mark on this paper, please? No, we're asked to note it. So um, can we agree to note it, please? Thank you. Um, 11.2 is the Grampian Area Partnership Forum. Unfortunately, Stephen can't be with us today. Um, any comments on that paper? Can we note it, please? Thank you. Um, and then 11.3, the Integration Joint Boards papers um, leads on this, are the, are the Chief Officers, of course. Any comments on the Integration Joint Board papers? No, can we note those as well then, please? Thank you, noted as well. And then we move on to item 12, the approved com committee forum and IJB minutes, which are all for noting. First of all, 12.1, um, the audit and risk committee of the 12th of December 2023. Give me a note, please. Thank you. Population health committee of the 14th of December 23. Can we note, please? Thank you. And then the forums, the area clinical forum of 17th of January 24. Can we note that, please? 
Thank you. And the Grampian Area Partnership Forum, two papers, 18th of January and the 15th of January 24. Can we note those, please? Thank you. Um, and then the Integration Joint Boards, 12.5, uh, the Aberdeenshire IJB of the 31st of January 24. Can we note that, please? Thank you. And the Murray IJB of the 25th of January 2024. Can we note that one, please? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for everyone's um, involvement with those papers and for everyone who's produced them as well. And then um, item 13 is any other business. I haven't had any other business notified to me. Any other business? No, thank you. So that brings us on to item 14, the date of the next meeting. When the next meeting will be Thursday, the 13th of June. So I look forward to every, meeting everyone there. And thank you to everyone else who's joined us for their involvement and interest in, in our meeting today. Thank you very much. OK, so I will close this meeting now. Um, and then we will um, reconvene as a as a as a board meeting separately. All right. Thank you very much. Close this meeting Thank now. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.